Good morning. I'm glad you had time, found time to visit us for our EC Day celebration this year. Normally, Earth and Space Exploration Day is on campus. And normally, this building that I'm standing in is full of people. And it, it's and, and lots of activity, lots of action. This year, because of COVID, we've decided one more year, we're going to do EC Day virtually. But I'm going to be your host. My name is Rick Alling, and I'm the direct, I'm manager of uh, outreach programs for the School of Earth and Space Exploration, and especially here at our building, ISTV4. During the program today, I'll come back and visit you a couple of times, and we'll be located in different locations around the building, so you can learn a little bit about what we do here and what kind of public engagement activities we have available for you. Today, just some housekeeping rules. This is a webinar format. We do not uh, um, have a chat open for you guys, right? But you can communicate with us, and we ask you to liberally use the question and answer button on your screen. Go ahead and just punch that, push in a question whenever you want. Uh, as you're listening to some of the presentations, if something comes to mind, please go ahead and ask. We'll get back to you right away if it's relevant, or we'll save some of those questions for a public part of the program when we can ask them live. But your participation is important, all right? The, uh, uh, there is a closed captioning screen on your screen. You're in charge of that. You can turn it on and off. We leave it on by default, but you can control it yourself. We uh, suggest you go full screen with your screen, and then you'll have the little window of the presenter just off to the side as you're sort of watching the program. I think about, that'll be a good way to do it. The presentation is about three hours, and we will have lots of little breaks with little visits to the school and question and answer breaks and things like that. So sit back and enjoy. We hope you enjoy the entire program, and that would be really great. There is another thing going on here. We are focusing on a mission that is called the James Webb Space Telescope. The telescope launches in December, December 18th. It's been a long time coming. ASU has a lot of fingerprints on this, uh, this telescope, figuratively. We actually do a lot of the research uh, and some of the development to the, teles the telescope, and we will be using it ourselves in our own cosmological research. So we're very excited about this launch. Many times during the programs, you'll hear some sort of session that mentions web and that kind of thing. And we have a special feature for young people today. If you are K-12, if you are a school age student and you're watching our program, after each one of the web presentation, there will be a slide. The slide will have a QR code and if you just go ahead, we'll leave it up long enough for you to do this, and you go ahead and just do, uh, fix on the QR code, you'll get a secret word. If you collect those secret words, there's a place to turn them in after the program. You'll hear about that a little later, and you will win prizes. So that kind of gives you a sense of uh, how much fun you can have staying with the program, watching all these little snippets we do about the James Webb Space Telescope and its importance to our program. And then you can have some, uh, some fun with it as well. I am going to uh, introduce your introduction speaker today. Uh, Dr. Minnie Wadwa is the director of the School of Earth and Space Exploration. Minnie is a planetary scientist and she's interested in the timescales and the processes that uh, tell us about the formation about the solar system and the planets. Minnie was recently named a principal scientist on the Mars sample return mission. This is something we've all been looking forward to. Remember the Perseverance rover is caching the little uh, parts of Mars, little sort of uh, specimens as it goes along. Someday we will send a spacecraft to there, grab those little caches and bring them home again. Many will be instrumental on the integrity of that science and how that's gonna work. And uh, we'll look forward to that in the future. Without any further ado, let's get started. Please welcome Director Mini Wadwa. Well, thank you very much, uh, Rick, for the introduction. And um, good morning to everyone and welcome to the fall 2021 Earth and Space Exploration Day. So we're incredibly pleased to have you here uh, this morning 
And as Rick said, you know, even though we cannot hold this event in person this year, and we're hoping to do so in the future, we're still excited to have you here and to share with you all of the engaging and fascinating research and discoveries and happenings in our school presenting, presented by our uh, students and researchers and faculty here today. So the, just to tell you a little bit about the history of this event, this event actually started in 1982 uh, and was actually founded by the famous ASU uh, planetary geologist and longtime faculty member, uh, the late professor Ron Greeley, and uh, originally was sponsored by the Space Photography Laboratory that he founded. Uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, the Space Photography Lab is now called the Ronald Greeley Center for Planetary Studies in Ron's honor. And when Ron actually first founded the SPL, however, as part of an agreement with NASA, uh, he initiated this annual open house to engage the public and to present the results uh, from NASA's uh, planetary spacecraft missions. So over the years, this event, of course, has grown a lot. And now we call it Earth and Space Exploration Day. And it showcases the incredible breadth of research uh, in all areas of Earth and space exploration uh, in our school. So I hope uh, you know, you'll enjoy the mix of presentations and demos and videos that we have here for you. And we look forward to seeing you back on campus, of course, when it's reasonably safe uh, to do so. But until then, I hope that you'll enjoy this virtual event. Uh, so to, to kick off the event today, I'm really thrilled to introduce our keynote speaker, doc, Dr. Rolf uh, Jansen. And Rolf received his PhD in 2000 from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands and uh, joined ASU after a brief uh, postdoctoral stint at the European Space Agency Space and Technology Center, or ESTEC. And he currently is a research scientist in our school, and his research focuses on studying the formation and assembly histories of nearby galaxies using ground and space-based telescopes. Um, as uh, Rick alluded to earlier, this uh, J JWST observatory uh, is going to be a successor actually to the Hubble Space Telescope, and uh, it's going to be launched in December 18th of 2021. And ASU has a lot of engagement with this particular mission, and uh, so we're going to be uh, looking forward to a lot of really exciting results and data in the years to come. And so today, Rolf will be telling us all that you want to know about the JWSD, the what, the why, the where, and the when. So um, welcome, Rolf, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Minnie, for that introduction. And thanks for this opportunity to tell you a little bit about the James Webb Space Telescope. Let me share my screen. Okay, so I will divide this talk into four simple questions. What web is, why we need it, and the where and when of this uh, indeed long-awaited space telescope. So what is web? The James Webb Space Telescope, or web for short, is a large infrared observatory in space. Web scientific payload consists of a telescope and an instrument module behind the primary mirror in this picture, both of which are kept in perpetual shape by a very large sun shield. On the sun facing side of that sun shield is the spacecraft bus with solar panels to provide energy, antennas for communication, electronics to support the telescope and instrument, and rocket engines and reaction wheels to keep Web in its orbit and pointed at science targets. As mentioned, in many respects, Webb is the scientific successor of Hubble, but for some years they are expected to both be operational and complement each other, with Webb continuing beyond where Hubble leaves off, and covering longer wavelengths to which Hubble is blind. Webb is a very different telescope than prior telescopes. It's an open structure without any telescope tube. Its primary mirror is not a single circular piece of glass, but instead a roughly hexagonal shape built from 18 smaller hexagonal mirrors. Those mirrors are uh, constructed from beryllium, and beryllium is the lightest possible metal. And the special property of beryllium is that it holds its shape and strength at cryogenic temperatures. 
those mirrors are coated with a very thin layer of pure gold, which reflects infrared light extremely well. And for those who are curious, it's a total of about 1.7 ounces of gold, or 48 and a quarter grams. Webb's primary mirror spans six and a half meters, or more than 21 feet in diameter. And that is 2.7 times wider than Hubble's mirror. And it has more than six times greater light collecting area. The angular resolution of Webb, however, at near infrared wavelengths is comparable to the resolution that we are used to seeing with Hubble at ultraviolet and visible wavelengths. Webb's five layer sun shield is roughly the size of a tennis court, and it keeps the telescope and instruments perpetually in the shade, such that they can cool down to temperatures that are more frigid than the surface of Pluto, about 40 Kelvin or uh, minus 380 degrees Fahrenheit. That is cold enough for the sensitive detectors to pick up the faint glow of the earliest galaxies in the universe without being overwhelmed by the heat glow of the telescope itself. Webb is too big to launch as is, however. The largest payload fairing on a rocket and the most reliable rocket uh, is Ariane 5, uh, would not fit the whole observatory as is. So it is designed to be folded up like origami and then unfold in space. And folded up, it fits inside the fairing, which is this aerodynamic nose cone and payload bay. Webb is sensitive to the reddest visible light and to invisible infrared light, thereby extending the wavelength and energy range that Hubble explores. This infrared light is recorded with four different instruments, most, most of which do double duty as both imagers and spectrographs, and with ample redundancy uh, and in capabilities between these instruments. The first instrument is the Near Infrared Camera, or NERCAM. It operates between the, the, the red part of the visible spectrum all the way to five microns in the near infrared. It consists of two independent optical systems that can operate either at the same time or separately. And they can simultaneously image in both a short and a long wavelength band. NERCAM also serves as the wavefront sensor to keep all these 18 mirror segments aligned to form one single mirror. And that uh, same mode also provides spectroscopic capability. The second instrument is near, the Near Infrared Spectrograph, or NERSPEC, which has a multi-object spectrograph to simultaneously record the uh, spectra of up to 100 objects, like stars or galaxies. And it operates over the same wavelength range as NERCAM. It can record object spectra in numerous different ways using either fixed slits or slits uh, or apertures that can be configured on the fly using its micro shutter array. NERSPEC also houses an integral field unit that allows mapping velocities and spectral energy, uh, spectral line strengths within extended objects. It also has a mid infrared instrument that goes to even longer wavelengths from 5 to 8, 28 microns slightly smaller field of view, uh, and it can uh, uh, perform uh, fixed aperture spectroscopy over a small aperture. It can also do low resolution spectrometry over a slightly smaller uh, wavelength range. And last, it has a coronagraph that allows you <coughs> to observe very dim uh, objects right next to very bright ones. But in order to operate as the, at these longer wavelengths, it needs to be cooled deeper to seven kelvins, or minus 447 degrees Fahrenheit. Last, there is the fine guidance sensor, FGS, and near infrared imager and slitless spectrograph, NIRIS. They're packaged together into a single instrument. They cover slightly uh, longer wavelength range than we can see with the human eye, but also to five microns at, at the red end. And it provides a redundancy with NERCAM, has the same filters to do imaging, just half the field of view. It can also do slitless spectroscopy over that wavelength range. And that has a special discovery potential 
that you can discover objects that you didn't know about beforehand or that you didn't know uh, didn't have accurate positions for and it serves as the guide camera for web to stay pointed at the targets of interest so that's the first section so why do we need web well let's step back a little bit when I was a boy, I was fascinated by anything astronomy and space related. I had seen planets with my own eyes, but I had to imagine what the Milky Way looked like because it was not visible under the light pollution, polluted skies of my hometown. The photographs of stars and nebulae in our Milky Way galaxy and galaxies at a vast distance beyond it were stark and showing mostly black and white blobs. And then there was Hubble. And suddenly, Hubble, with its uh, a much darker sky background and higher resolution and access to wavelengths of light that are inaccessible on the ground, uh, opened up uh, colorful places that are crossed with integrate filaments of glowing interstellar gas and dark obscuring dust. After this revolution that was Hubble, we know now that all large galaxies have a supermassive black hole at their center. Even our own Milky Way galaxy and our nearest big neighbor, M33, or otherwise called the Andromeda galaxy. Hubble gave us a sharp views of starbursting galaxies and of galaxies that are in the process of merging with one another. And this allowed us to trace the galaxy assembly and subsequent evolution over the past 12 billion years of the universe. This spectacular image captures 12 billion years of that cosmic history. Galaxies at redshift that are larger than seven are very hard to find here. They appear dim, very red and tiny, and they are very rare. The wavelengths of light that were emitted by distant galaxies get stretched out as that light travels towards us. Hubble is sensitive to ultraviolet, visible and near infrared light. And for more than 30 years, it has allowed us to see to great distances into the universe. And because of the time it takes to travel far back into time. But when the ultraviolet and visible light that was emitted from the first galaxies to light of the universe get stretched to infrared wavelengths, they are so long that Hubble can no longer detect them. Moreover, as distances get larger, the light we receive gets dimmer. So we need a bigger telescope to collect a sufficient amount of light. And last, these earliest galaxies were much smaller than those in the present day universe, in the nearby universe. And larger telescopes can resolve finer details. So in order to detect the light from the very first galaxies, we need a space telescope that sees farther into the infrared and that has a larger mirror to collect enough of the dim light and to create sharp images of such small objects. So the next section, which is relatively short, is the where of Webb. So last month, Webb was finally shipped from Redondo Beach in California to Kourou in French Guiana in a special shipping container on a special transport sport ship. It went through the Panama Canal and then to French Guiana to the spaceport of Kourou. Webb will be launched from there on an Ariane 5 rocket to an orbit around a special point in space, the second Lagrange point or L2. And in that L2 halo orbit, it can always get power from the sun because it always has one side of the observatory that bathes in sunlight and it always will have communication with the earth because it goes around the earth in exactly one year, year just it goes around the sun in exactly one year just like the earth does the telescope itself never sees the sun the earth or the moon it stays hidden behind that sun shield you do have to expend some fuel for operation and to stay in this orbit. And L2 is too far away for astronauts to surf to surface web. 
So that's why there is so much built-in redundancy and overlap in instrument capabilities. Another part of the where is that the components and instruments for web were built in 27 US states in the District of Columbia and in 13 other countries. Because web is a NASA-led partnership between NASA, the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency. So next will be uh, the preparation for the actual launch on December 18th. And it's good to know that the last two launches of Ariane 5 went off without a hitch. Now the launch itself will of course uh, be, be uh, uh, harrowing. It's eight minutes of terror in a sense. But after uh, the Ariane gives the spacecraft enough speed, it will deploy its communications antenna and solar arrays quite soon after. And then ab after about 12 hours, it will execute its first trajectory, uh, trajectory maneuver. That will send it on its way to the desired point in space. In the weeks that follow, one after the other portion of the spacecraft will unfold and get deployed and locked in place in a staged unfolding of the origami. And the stages that are required to succeed are the fore and aft sun shield trays will fall down, then the telescope is raised on its mast, the sun shield is unrolled, separated, stretched in stages to its final configuration, and the secondary mirror is lowered and locked into place. Last, the two side panels of the three mirror segments uh, each are rotated forward to complete the primary mirror. Meanwhile, Webb will continue to travel to its destination orbit around L2 for about a month, while the telescope and instruments are cooling down, shaded behind that sun shield. Then follow roughly five more months during which the mirror is aligned to a perfect shape and focus, and the instruments will be checked out and calibrated. This will be followed by the most exciting part when the first early release science images and measurements arrive on Earth. And shortly thereafter, uh, I am particularly excited to see the first images from a guaranteed time observing program led by Professor Windhorst here at ASU. We have been preparing for these observations since 2002. So in summary, Hubble revolutionized our understanding of the, of the universe. Webb will build upon this and trigger its own revolution. And there's unforeseen uh, signs that, uh, that nobody had thought about early in the development of Webb that involves the observation of exoplanets. Webb will give insights in their compositions or at least their atmospheric compositions. Also new are interstellar visitors. We know now of two for sure that came from outside of our solar system. Webb will see them much earlier and can track them much longer than present uh, telescopes. And last, Webb will be your space telescope, yielding years of exciting results and stunning pictures, just like Hubble did. And with that, I thank you. And I'm available for questions. Thank you very much, Rolf, for that excellent presentation. Um, I guess I have a, a question uh, that I think people might be interested in is you talk a lot about um, spectroscopy and how that seems to be a very important part of what Webb will be doing. Could you maybe explain what that is in a little more detail and what, what sort of things you're interested in that relate to spectroscopy? Uh, yes, uh, a lot of processes, physical processes that can take place in space and in our, on Earth, they leave a chemical fingerprint a chemical fingerprint in the light that is emitted by those processes. And if you take the incoming light with a telescope, focus it in an instrument that can spread out that light according to its energy or its wavelength, then you can figure out which of these elements were present and in what kind of state they were present. And that tells us in a, in a, in a significant way more than you could tell from just a, a picture or an image you do require more photons, more packages of light to come in in order to do this. So really, really faint objects, you don't have a choice. You can only 
try and detect them in an image and uh, hopefully wait for even bigger telescopes either on Earth or in space. Very cool. All right, we do have another question for you. Um, what material is the solar panels made of? Can the folding structure of the solar rays used in the JWST be used for CubeSats? Uh, I am not entirely sure, but I think that these are fairly standard solar panels that have been used on many other spacecraft. Uh, in many cases, when you have a mission uh, that you send to space, you want to know for sure that all the risky parts have been figured out already. So in many cases, you start actually with small satellites, test out technology there, and then uh, employ them on a, a bigger, more costly space mission. Very cool. And then another question um, would be, uh, what um, does, so we often see these images, right, of Webb where, where the large mirror is sort of pointed parallel to uh, the sun shield. And of course the sun shield, you know, needs to stay pointing toward the sun. Um, can that mirror turn around like, or does it have to stay in this orientation we see in all the images? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, in fact, the whole observatory can pivot around the axis that points towards the sun. And that means that you can, at any given time, uh, you can observe uh, objects that are within sort of an annulus, a band or a loop around the sky. And then as uh, the Earth moves around the sun and the L2 point moves with the Earth around the sun, throughout the, the course of a year, you will be able to uh, access any point in the sky. But at any given point of the year, you may access uh, uh, only a portion of the sky, the portion that falls within that loop, that band. Okay, so not only you can't point at the sun, you also can't point directly away from the sun. Uh, that is correct. So there, there are observational restrictions and complications in, in designing observing programs. All right. Well, I think that that actually brings us toward the close of most of our questions. Thank you so much, Rolf, for that excellent presentation. I'm now going to hand us off to Alicia Hyatt for some other good stuff. Okay. Thanks very much, Liam. Thank you, Rolf. Thank you, Liam. What a great presentation. And we have many more presentations coming up for you. Um, but first, what I want you to do is get prepared for your first QR code. We're going to have that displayed on the screen right now. So go ahead and get your phones out, scan your QR code, um, and don't forget there will be prizes towards the end. So make sure you're paying attention to that. Um, but with that being said, it gives me a great uh, honor or sense of pleasure to introduce our first group or our next speaker, um, which is Zen Holmes, who is a part of the, the HOG group or the Hydrothermal Organic Geochemistry group. So Zen, Welcome to the screen. Um, you can take it from here. Hi, um, it's great to be with everybody this morning. Um, we have a, <clears throat> a video um, that was recorded by my um, friend and associate, Kate, uh, and she's going to, uh, to explain and demonstrate a little bit about what we do in the HOG lab. And um, <clears throat> how you can you also can take part in some fun uh, planetary inspired chemistry. Hello, everyone. I'm Caitlin, and I am part of the Hog Group here at ASU. Today, we'd like to give you a taste of what that means, what we like to study and some of the neat ways our planet has of getting things done. Then I'd like to conduct an experiment with everyone so that you can be a hog scientist too. Let's start with this hog thing I keep saying. What's that all about? Well, hog stands for hydrothermal organic geochemistry, but that's not much clearer, is it? Here, 
Let's show you instead. In the hog group, we're interested in studying what happens at places like these. Hydrothermal vents. You can see here the hot water escaping from the deep within the Earth's crust. Believe it or not, this liquid can be as hot as 400 degrees Celsius or 750 degrees Fahrenheit. This water is carrying minerals and solutions that have been trapped inside the planet for millions of years. It's no surprise then that some fascinating chemistry happens here. See, the Earth and other planets don't do chemistry the same way that people do. Big industrial plants often use strong acids, toxic solvents, and sometimes heavy metals to make reactions favorable. This isn't good for us or for the planet, but the Earth doesn't pollute itself. Instead, planets use water, heat, and common minerals to make things happen. Studying locations like these can inspire us to do cleaner chemistry. We call this geomimicry. And thinking this way can give us clues as to how these environments could have contributed to the beginnings of life here on Earth, maybe at other worlds too. But I promised an experiment, didn't I? So let's see what all the fuss is about. With a bit of heat and water, we can make some pretty fantastic chemistry happen too. But don't just take my word for it. Try this for yourselves. Remember though, the heat trapped inside a planet is no joke, and neither is what we're doing here today. Make sure to not work alone and always keep safety in mind. Remember, we want to see how effective a planet's strategy is for doing chemistry. So we'll use heat to make our reactions happen in a watery solvent. We're going to begin with 753 grams of sucrose, but you might know this better as three and three quarter cup of granulated sugar. This will go into our reaction vessel. A medium saucepan should do nicely. Next, we'll combine 237 milliliters of dihydrogen monoxide. Between you and me, that's just a cup of water. And now we'll incorporate 355 milliliters of saccharide solution or one and a half cups of light corn syrup. We are ready to add some serious heat, medium heat to be exact. We'll see the ingredients go through several transitions. First, they'll melt, dissolve. Then we'll see them combine as they heat up. And finally, they'll come to a boil. Once boiling, we'll bring the temperature up to 150 degrees Celsius or 300 Fahrenheit. What changes have you noticed? Now the bulk of our work is done and we can add some enhancements, esters, and color indicator. I mean orange extract and food coloring. Once everything's combined into a nice homogeneous mixture, we pour on to our greased baking tray. But remember, this stuff is H-O-T hot. Our tasty experiment needs some time to cool and solidify. It's a good thing we're not really inside the earth, like a rock that could take us millions of years. While we wait, just think about how different our mixture looks from when we started. And now we can enjoy our delicious candy creation. Yum, these are definitely my favorite kinds of crystals. So what have we done today? First, we talked about what the hog group is all about. Then we visited some hydrothermal vents to see some planetary chemistry in action. And finally, we did a bit of geochemistry ourselves and saw just how effective these tools can be. Thank you for taking the time to get to know us hogs a little bit better. We hope that you stay safe and try some geochemistry on your own. I hope that everybody has enjoyed um, <clears throat> our little slice of hog. Um, and I would love uh, I would love some uh, to answer some questions if anybody has them. And while we're waiting for our caller to come on and take questions, I'm gonna go ahead and launch one more QR code. So go ahead and scan that while we are scanning the questions to ask a question.
I can ask a quick question. So um, at the final product of that solution you made, what was it? What does that actually translate to? Is there is there an actual name that we can associate with what you made? Then you're muted and we're not sure if you heard Justin's question. Oh, I, I, I heard his question. Am I still muted? Oh, you're good now. Go ahead. We can hear you. Okay, awesome. Sorry, Justin. Thanks. Um, right. So um, the product that we made uh, was a combination uh, of sugar molecules <clears throat> um, and they had solidified and uh, into crystals that we know best as candy. Um, but as far as a chemical name, I, uh, I would say um, a sort of aggregation of sucrose and uh, fructose uh, sugar crystals. Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, Zen. And now I'm going to introduce um, Sina Kirk with the Infiniscope Gallery Exploration. All right, good morning, everyone. Happy to be here on EC Day. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen here. And that's not the right thing. Okay, here we go. Uh, so my name is Sina and I'm with the Infiniscope Project and the Infiniscope Project is through the Center for Education Through Exploration at Arizona State University. We are a NASA funded project that creates fully digital experiences, explorations of other worlds, um, opportunities to engage in real world science, simulations of complex systems and connections in 3D space. Uh, but we're also an educator community. So we help teachers uh, by gaining access to lesson plans, alignments, visualizations, best practices. Uh, we build connections with educators through professional development. Uh, we create virtual worlds and fully digital experiences and allow teachers to customize their own content. But today we're here to talk a little bit about web and to do some galaxy exploration. So let's do that. All right, so when we look up at the night sky, it seems like there are a million points of lights out there, but Earth's atmosphere actually filters out some of the light that reaches Earth and blurs the light that does reach the ground. But the light can tell us a lot about the universe and to capture more of that light in the universe, we need to send telescopes out into space beyond Earth's atmosphere. With each additional telescope, we continue to learn an incredible amount about the universe. And new telescopes observe different regions of space and are able to capture different types of light that offer unique perspectives of objects in space. So it would be great if we could just send one telescope out and it could capture all of the data that we need and it could see all of the regions of space, but it takes highly specialized equipment to do that. And so each one only gives us a little glimpse of the universe. So here we have a couple of images um, from previous space missions. So in the top left there, you can see the Crab Nebula. So when we observed this from the ground, we originally thought it was just a new star. But through imagery that we got from the Chandra Observatory, which uh, studies in x-rays, we were able to actually determine that it was a nebula left behind from a supernova. Hubble has given us um, a lot of imagery like the refinement of the Ring Nebula that you see there in the bottom left. And the antenna galaxies uh, image that you see there is actually a combination of the x-ray data from Chandra, which you'll see in blue. The um, info from Hubble is kind of in that brownish gold color. And the red data that you see there is from the Spitzer Space Telescope. So all of the telescopes can work together to give us this expanded view of the universe. So you've seen a few images of objects that are closer to Earth, but what about those that are really far away? 
what do the earliest galaxies in the universe look like? So this image here contains approximately 10,000 galaxies that extend back in time to within a few hundred million years of the Big Bang. And when we look out at space, we're actually looking back in time because the light arriving at Earth from the farthest objects in the universe is light that, those, that left those objects behind billions of years ago. So we're gonna take a look at a couple of galaxies, but before we do that, what is a galaxy? So think about the images you've seen so far. And Kim, can we go ahead and launch that first poll? Yep, here we go. Okay, so you're gonna see a poll that comes up. It's gonna have a question and a couple of answer options. Give you a couple seconds here. What do you think a galaxy is? Is it a particle of debris in the solar system that does not act as a satellite of any planet? Is it a visible body of liquid or frozen crystal droplets suspended above a planetary surface? These are some big words for Saturday morning, but I know you guys got it in you. Is it a massive system of stars, gas, dust, and dark matter bound together by gravity? Or is it the visible path of a meteoroid as it enters Earth's atmosphere? Okay, looks like, I think we can, well, we'll give you 10 more seconds here and then we'll close it. Looks like everybody's listening to what you're saying. <laughs> awesome, okay. So go ahead and close it. And so it is a massive system of stars, gas, dust, and dark matter that's bound together by gravity. You guys are, you guys are awesome. Okay. So now I'm going to give you a little chance to explore some galaxies. So um, for this activity, you're going to want to open a new browser window. And you're going to want to adjust the size so that you can see both the screen that I'm sharing and the new browser window. So if you're working at home with a parent, I'll give you just a couple of seconds here to kind of get that set up before I move on. You should be able to see both the screen that I'm sharing because that has the, um, the URL that you're going to need. And you do need a new browser window open so that you'll be able to explore the, um, the simulation. So once you have that set up, uh, you're going to go to the link that's here. So obviously you can't click the link, so you'll need to type it into your um, address bar. So the HTTPS colon um, the two slashes you don't actually need to type that in, it'll automatically populate. What you'll need to do is just type in the uh, bit.ly slash galaxy exploration, and that's all one word, lowercase. And when you do that, you're probably gonna get a little pop-up that has this enroll in course section, which is what you see on the left side of the slide. And you'll wanna check that I'm not a robot, and then click the enroll button. Don't worry, you're not really enrolling in a course. There's no grades here just so that you can get into the simulation to, uh, to play around with some galaxies. When you do that, you'll see the middle picture. So you see galaxy sim and you'll need to select it. And then you're gonna get a pop-up window that um, gives you the op opportunity here to create an account. We don't wanna do that today. I'm just gonna click the maybe later, just gonna be in the lower left corner there. And then that's gonna get you into this activity where we can look at a couple of different galaxies and explore them. So I know it takes just a little bit to work through that. So I'll just give you another 15 seconds or so here. So we can make sure that we're all on board for the next couple of stages. And I'm gonna move ahead here. So once you're in, you're gonna see um, a window that looks something like this. You'll notice that there's kind of a library of galaxy images uh, in the very left-hand column. And you'll also see that you can scroll down that column. So I'm gonna give you a, just a little bit here to kind of scroll through some of those images. 
And these are different galaxy images that we've collected from the different space missions that have been out there. And as you look at them, I want you to think about whether or not they all look the same. Do all of these galaxy images, do they all look the same? Do they look different? I think there's about 16 pictures there or so to look through. So I'm just gonna use that scroll bar. And I'm gonna have Kim launch poll number two for us. Do all galaxies look the same? Wow, you guys are so fast. I love it. You're just on it. Okay, just give you about five more seconds here. Okay, so no, galaxies do not all look the same. They actually can look quite different, but you may have noticed that there are some similarities between them. And they, some of them do have similar shapes. So the next thing that I want you to do is to see if you can categorize those galaxies by shapes. So there's a couple of ways you can do this. You can, um, we can simply drag and drop them into the two columns that are there, but you can also add additional columns by clicking the little um, add category. Uh, you'll see the, the middle yellow arrow there is pointing to it. And you can also um, remove categories by clicking at the bottom. And you can also rename the categories simply by clicking on the text there. So this is going to take you just a little bit. So I'm going to give you maybe a minute, two minutes here. So look through the galaxy images that are in the left-hand column. And then I want you to categorize them by shape. So you'll just click on the galaxy and you'll drag it into a category. See if you can sort them into couple of different categories just based on shape. You're not sure where to put a particular one, that's okay. Just do the best you can to kind of sort them. Try to find the ones that are the most similar. Start with those. And then as you get to the end of the stack, see if you can fit the other ones into their own categories as well. Okay, if you haven't sorted them all, that's okay. I think you might have enough information to answer our next question. So Kim, if you could launch poll three for us, please. And that is galaxies can be classified by their shapes into all of the following categories, except, so which one of these did you not see? Did you see spiral galaxies, irregular galaxies? 
triangular galaxies, elliptical galaxies. Give you just a couple more seconds here. Okay, so it looks like uh, most of us chose triangular galaxy, which is correct. So spiral galaxies, we saw quite a few of those. Um, in fact, in the in the image that you're looking at now, uh, the first category there is spiral. So you can see a couple of those there. Irregular just means it doesn't have a particular shape. Elliptical um, is kind of the, the elongated circle ones that you saw. But we didn't see any triangular galaxies because we haven't found any of those in the universe yet. So what can shape tell us about a galaxy? Uh, we know that the most distant earliest galaxies we've seen tend to be smaller and less structured than those in the nearby universe, but the earliest galaxies in the universe haven't really been detected. So the galaxy that you see here in the inset was observed as it was 13.4 billion years ago, but Webb will be able to show us even more galaxies that existed in the early universe. And it can do this mainly because of the type of light that it captures and how good it is at capturing it. So you can see here, these are previous NASA missions and the types of data that they've collected in terms of the wavelengths. So you can see, uh, we talked briefly about Chandra before. So that was in the X-ray um, wavelength. You can see Hubble and Spitzer, which we also mentioned, are in that visible and just a little bit into the infrared. And we also on the on the ground there, you can see the Earth based telescopes as well. So we can actually take a look at some of the galaxies that you just sorted in different wavelengths. So you'll see in the on the right hand side of the screen there where it says wavelength. You can use those radio buttons to observe the galaxies um, that are there in different wavelengths. So as you click through, you may notice that a particular galaxy isn't, um, there isn't a picture for it in ultraviolet or an X-ray. And that's simply because we don't have data on all of those galaxies in all of those wavelengths. So the, the ones that you're looking through is, is actual data that we've collected. So, we have images for most of them, but if you find one that isn't available in a particular wavelength, that's why. So I'll give you a little bit here to just click through, um, select one of the galaxies, and then select the different wavelengths to get an idea of what it looks like in different, in different wavelengths. And then we're gonna launch the next poll for you. So our fourth poll here. And the question is, do galaxies look the same in all wavelengths? Do galaxies look the same in all wavelengths? Okay, it looks like, uh, no, they don't. And that's correct. They actually look very different. You can see um, different, there's obviously different colors, but it also picks up different aspects. So it can, it can look different in shape as well. And so, so you saw something similar to this in the, the keynote presentation. But uh, Webb is specialized in infrared light, which is just beyond the visible light that the human eye can detect. And you'll see Hubble collected a lot of data in the visible range. 
Spitzer did a little bit in infrared, but James Webb is going to specialize in infrared. And because as you heard in the keynote, because of the size of it and basically how good it is at collecting that light, we're gonna be able to get really amazing images from it. And the infrared aspect is important. And I think you saw this in the keynote as well, uh, because we know that the universe is expanding and as space itself stretches, so does the wavelength of the light from the first galaxies. And it stretches into infrared light. And so Webb will examine these early galaxies and eras that followed in new detail, providing us insight and to help us learn more about how galaxies evolve. And it can build on the discoveries from Hubble and Hubble is still in service, so we can kind of work in tandem. And we can learn more about dust, stars, and galaxies over cosmic time. But it'll also help us learn more about um, black holes and the history of star formation. So there's a lot of different things that we can learn from Webb in the coming, in the coming years. So I'll close out with our last poll. So Kim, if you'll launch poll number five for us. So why do astronomers study wavelengths other than visible light like X-ray and infrared? So is it because the information provided by some lights not reliable? Is it because observations in different wavelengths provide different information about stars and other objects? Is it because the equipment required for observations in other wavelengths is less expensive? Or is it because visible light only provides information about the closest objects in our galaxy? It's a little bit tougher, I think. But you guys have been awesome all morning. So I know you got this. Okay, just a few more seconds here before we close out. Okay, so this one was definitely tricky because I think I wanted to pick the last one, but the answer is because observations in different wavelengths provide different information about stars and other objects. So with that, I am going to thank you for joining us uh, for this presentation on Webb Space Telescope and the galaxy exploration. Remember, Webb is launching December 18th, but that there's so many milestones that are going to happen after that. So from the deployment to first images, there's lots of Webb stuff uh, to follow in the coming in the coming years, even. And if you want to learn more about Webb. Uh, you can explore our web virtual tour. So it's at bit.ly slash ESE tour it. And there's a bonus in there. There's actually a QR code for the EC Day James Webb passport that's hidden in one of the hotspots. So if you find it, you can get an extra code word. And if you want to explore more Earth and space science learning experiences, you can visit us at infiniscope.org. And if you're an educator, we do have educator resources. So you'll want to just join our network. Um, and we have lots of new stuff coming in the future. And with that, I'll say thank you so much for joining me. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the presentations today. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, I'm sorry, Kim, did I interrupt you? No, you're good. I'm going to go okay. ahead. We did have a request to um, share reshare the first QR code from um, the keynote. So I'm going to share that one and then I will give that a couple seconds and then we will share the next um, we'll share the next Perfect. one. Perfect. So as Kim mentioned, now is the time to get ready for your QR code. So go ahead and pull your cell phones out and scan this QR code. And then this was the last one. And then in just a few moments, we will go ahead and introduce this new one. Um, but with that being said, there is a rumor here that Rick Alling and Alex Blanche 
are in the lobby of ISCB4 and they are ready to go live in front of Mission Ops. Can anyone confirm if that is true or not? We are ready. Awesome. I'm going to hand it over to Rick Alling and the amazing dynamic duo that is Alex Lunch and Rick. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I should, I meant to introduce Alex when we first started, but there is somebody on the other side of this camera. You're going to meet him a little bit later because he's presenting about docenting and being a student here at the, uh, at the university. But uh, right now he's running the camera for us and he's doing an excellent job. So I'm back in the lobby. And as I said before, we're going to introduce you to a couple of places around the building uh, in my little interludes as I come back and do these little breaks. Um, and this is to get you excited about coming here next year. This year, because of COVID, we concentrated on getting our classes started again. We just wanted students in classrooms. We wanted to get that teaching component done and done, and we've done that. And so next year, after the first of the year, our first public program on the schedule is in late February, on February the 26th. Somebody will correct me if I got that date wrong. And the event is called Open Door. And so the university is open and the public is ready to come and so february we'll be getting ready for that i'm just going to give you a little preview of some of the things that you'll see when you come here and visit us in our building uh, behind this desk right here is a, is a wall of countdown clocks there are 10 some of them are counting down to missions that we expect to take off within the next two and three years some of them are counting up from missions that launched over 20 and 10 years ago so there's a uh, things going on we have a long legacy of running missions, running pieces of missions, instruments on missions, and all of this stuff associated with space exploration and especially planetary studies. Today, I want to kind of focus on one of those. I'm going to shift the camera view over and move over a little bit. Let me grab my prop right here. A little Perseverance rover is going to come with us. I'm just going to move over this way a bit. So. The glassed-in room behind me is called a Mission Operations Center, or a SOC, Science Operations Center. And there are some ladies in there, Kelsey and, and uh, Laura are working today. I'll tell you in a little bit about what they're doing and what they're getting ready for, but I want to kind of talk a little bit about missions and how missions are designed and how missions are sorted out in the hierarchy of, of responsibility. So uh, NASA mission has what we call a principal investigation. Investigator. Very, very important word to remember, so or, or phrase to remember. Principal investigator is PI. There is a PI for a mission. The person that's in charge of all the science that goes on, everything that that mission is supposed to accomplish, this is, this is the, the role of the PI of the mission. And then any of the gadgets, uh, cameras or monitors or spectrometers or things that are on, attach the spacecraft, uh, to attach the mission and deliver some of the data that it will do. There is also a PI, a principal investigator in charge of those devices. In this particular the room, what they're working on is a device called MassCam Z. It is a pair of cameras and they are attached to the mast. I'm going to show you here. I'm going to get a little close and show you where this is. Um, uh, there are two cameras. So here is the Perseverance rover. And you can see, I'm just going to use a little pen to point out. This is called the mast. It sticks up sort of out the top. There's a head on the top that sort of has some instruments on it. And right here and right here are a pair of cameras. They're identical. They're matched. They uh, both do the same thing. But remember, there's like a right and a left, just like your eyes. So these two cameras can actually investigate Mars in a couple of different ways. I'll tell you how some of the ways we use the cameras. Uh, but we do it in stereo, as it were. So we can actually get uh, 3D dimensionality out of objects and uh, things that we're investigating on the, 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 the surface of Mars. So this is really very cool. I'm going to see if I can if I can get a little bit closer here. This is the life size of those cameras. So these are what's called engineering models. And before these are attached to a spacecraft and integrated, as, the, as NASA calls it, into a spacecraft project, uh, they build models like this. We need to know the exact size and dimensions to just really tight specifications. We need to know the exact weight. And we also need to know that they're going to operate. So they operate them separately. They put them together. 
test and test and test and test, make sure that everything is going to work right, and then they're shipped to the assembly facility. They're attached to the space to, in this case, the rover itself, and then all of the instruments are integrated so that they run them together, so they know one isn't interfering with another. And then once everybody is satisfied, yep, it's there, it's going to work, it's packed up, put into a spacecraft, and launched out to the thing. Uh, the Perseverance rover landed on Mars last February, and it's been delivering information ever since. That brings me back to Mission Ops. The PI for this particular instrument is of Dr. James Bell. He works here at the university. He's a professor here, and he actually has a, per, a principal investigator role on lots of different projects. In this particular case, mast cam Z, a pair of cameras on Perseverance rover. Here's the really cool part. The information that comes from the rover every day gets delivered to this room. The ladies behind me, Laura and Kelsey, are actually uh, pulling down those images, they process them, they check them to make sure that they're complete, they color correct them, they library them, catalog them, and then get them available to the scientific community. So they play that principal role of organizing this data as it comes from the rover. And I say this happens every day. So the rover works during a Mars daytime. At night, the rover sends back the information it collected then we get it. And we also have to upload instructions for the next day. So not only do we get yesterday's work, but we also communicate to the rover what we expect it to do tomorrow. And all of that kind of work happens from a room like this, and it goes on for the duration of the mission. A Mars day is slightly different than an Earth day. And so they have to change their schedule every once in a while just to match up, right? Because they want to be uh, in the room at the right time because the data comes down essentially 50 minutes later every day. And so sometimes their shift is later, sometimes their shift is earlier. Uh, today they happen to be working right now on this Saturday. So that's really pretty cool. One more thing I could say about this, I was just interviewing uh, Laura and Kelsa just before I came on the air, and I was asking him, what's coming up, what's new, what's really cool, what, what should we look forward to? It turns out tomorrow, uh, I'm sorry, next week, uh, there's going to be an operation where they use a drill on the end of this head here. They basically drill into Mars, and then the material is, is moved up into a little tube. The tube is moved up and stored into a, uh, a, a safe, if you want, a place where it can, can be stored and kept for a period of time. This is caching. The role we play with our cameras is we photograph that, we image that, we make sure that it's working, we make sure that we got the right material, how much material, we can document that. We can also also watch as it gets loaded into its, uh, its safe, right? And we can actually make sure that it gets in right and it's there and all that stuff. So we are sort of the eyes on the rover that make sure that this uh, process happens. And so these ladies are getting ready for that. Next week, the assignment for the rover is to watch that caching process where it's taking this, is this material and saving it for later. That relates to when I introduced Minnie at the beginning of this program. Remember, I said that she's just been named as an investigator and a chief scientist for the sample return. Those samples that we're picking up tomorrow, or I'm sorry, next week, in the next couple of days, those are the ones that later will come back to Earth, and then Minnie and her team will be able to watch those. So really very exciting. When we come back in about an hour, I'm just about to turn you back over to your program. When we come back, we're going to investigate a little here. Let's move this way a little bit. We're going to investigate deeper into the gallery, and we're going to show you some other things that are going on here, and, uh, and we'll see you then. So right now, I'm going to turn the program back over to Kim, and she will start the introduction of the next series of presentations. Thank you, guys. Here, we'll see you in about an hour. Thanks, Rick. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor David Williams from the Ron Greeley Center, and he is going to uh, give us a presentation, and I'm going to let you take it away, Dave. Thanks. All righty. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All righty. And hopefully you can see my screen. Yeah, and great. Okay, well, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave Williams. I am a research professor here in the School of Earth and Space Exploration 
And uh, I'm the director of the Ron Greeley Center. Now, if you've been at the ASU before, you know, in the Bateman Physical Sciences F-Wing, we have the Ron Greeley Center. It is a NASA Planetary Data Center where we actually archive all of the photographic prints uh, from all of the NASA planetary missions going back from the 1960s through the 1990s. We also have a computer lab where we can access all the digital versions of images, both from those missions and the more recent missions from the 1990s and 2000s all the way up to the present. Now, uh, in addition to running the Greeley Center, which you'll all be able to come and see in person next year uh, when we do the open door event uh, that uh, has been mentioned previously, in addition to running that center, I am the uh, a uh, co I co-investigator and member of the science team on the NASA Psyche mission. And this is one of the, uh, the big projects we are working on in CC, getting this mission ready to launch later in 2022, uh, less than a year from now. So what I thought I'd do, I'd talk to you a little bit about this mission. And then later, Rick is gonna show you where they're gonna be building a model of the spacecraft in the gallery of exploration in ISTB-4. So this presentation is something I gave at the Geological Society of America annual meeting in Portland uh, back last month. So I wanna tell you a little bit about the target of this particular mission, which is asteroid number 16, which is named Psyche, and what the mission is gonna do when we get out there. And then I'm also gonna go and, and give a broad overview of all of the other planetary missions that are active right now and show you which ones ASU is involved in. So what is asteroid 16 Psyche? Well, first we should probably ask what are asteroids? Asteroids are the rocky remnants left over from the formation of the solar system four and a half billion years ago. They're irregular bodies, they're cratered, they're mostly rocky, they might have some dust or ices on it, uh, but they mostly occur um, in the main asteroid belt between the orbits of the planets Mars and Jupiter. Although there are some asteroids that cross the Earth's orbit, we call them near-Earth asteroids, and then there's another population that orbits with the planet Jupiter, 60 degrees ahead and behind, the Trojans, and we have a mission going there that I'll mention later. But asteroid number 16, which was named Psyche, um, is roughly elliptical, as you can see in these pictures. It was discovered by the uh, Italian astronomer Hannibale de Gasparis back in 1852. This particular asteroid, you can see it's pretty big, um, and I'll show you in comparison to some other asteroids in a moment there. It orbits at about 2.9 astronomical units. That's, that's about 2.9 times the distance between Earth and the Sun. So it's at the far end of the, of the main asteroid belt. It takes about five Earth years to orbit the Sun once, but it takes only four hours to rotate on its axis once. Now, the thing that makes asteroid 16 Psyche interesting is the, is the largest of what we call the M-type asteroids. And M in this case means metal. We think that this is actually made up of metal. We think it is perhaps the exposed core of an asteroid parent body. Perhaps it's the source of the iron meteorites. And so we're gonna send a, the Psyche spacecraft out there to explore it. And uh, just to show you an example, all right, here you see a bunch of asteroids all the way from very, very small steins all the way up to very uh, large Lutetia. And then the big one here is the asteroid Vesta. It was the fourth asteroid discovered, target of the Dawn mission, which operated last decade. It covers about the surface area of the state of Arizona. Now, when I add in Psyche, you see Psyche is somewhat smaller than that, but it's still very, very large for an asteroid. To give you better context, take a look at this. So this shows you that Psyche is basically as large as the state of Massachusetts, or it's the size of the distance between Phoenix and Flagstaff, if you've ever driven that distance. Now, a NASA mission like Psyche, uh, you know, we, when we do a NASA robotic mission to explore a new place in the solar system, we set up a set of scientific questions that we want to answer. And since we've never been to an M-type asteroid before, we are not certain about it. So we basically want to ask the, the main questions about it. Is Psyche a core as been theorized? Is it a, the remnant metallic core or is it something else? Does it have a diverse surface? What are the ages of the different parts of the surface? Does it have elements from Earth's core? Does it have any indication of, of how it compares to Earth's core in terms of its composition? And does it have any extensive topography? And this particular painting here, this is an artist's painting of one possible way that the surface of Psyche could look. So a metallic object with craters preserved and then perhaps some sort of stuff on the surface filling the craters. It could be silicate rock like it's in the Earth's crust. It could be 
sulfur or some sort of uh, material that extruded from the interior, could be carbonaceous material from other asteroids. That's one of the things we want to go there and find out. So the idea about this particular asteroid and this cartoon is, is that it was a cooling planetismal with a crust, a mantle, and a molten core that was hit by another asteroid in what we call a hit and run impact that knocked off a lot of the crust. So you just had this molten core exposed to space that would have quickly cooled and the, the grayish metal would have crystallized on the surface. It would have had a magnetic field because it was a molten metal. You might've had yellow sulfur extracted from it and then it would have all completely uh, uh, crystallized and preserved the magnetic field on the surface. So this is one idea that we have about it, and this is one of the things we're going to investigate. So here's a diagram of what the Psyche spacecraft looks like uh, based on its design. So you see it looks a lot like an Earth orbiting telecommunications satellite there, but it, and that's what's all in the interior there, but it's also got some very interesting components to it the high gain antenna to communicate with Earth, this jungle gym here, which is where it's got some of the instruments. It's got magnetometers to measure the magnetic field. It's got a gamma ray and neutron spectrometer. They measure the elemental abundance, the amount of iron and silicon and potassium. And in the case of a neutron spectrometer, the amount of hydrogen, which will tell us if there's any water ice on the surface. You can see the ion engines down here uh, at the bottom. And then here on the backside are the multispectral imagers. These are the cameras that will take pictures of the surface. Another thing that's on the Psyche mission is this instrument here, DSOC. That's a digital uh, optical communications, a deep space optical communications instrument. And the idea is to use lasers to communicate information on the spacecraft back to Earth. So this is the size you can see here with a, a person over here to scale with the solar arrays fully deployed, it's gonna be about the size of a tennis court. So how is this mission gonna work? Well, the scheduled launch is in August of 2022 and we're going to use our ion engines once we're boosted out of Earth's gravity to fire up and we fire for long periods of time as we spiral around the sun as the bodies in the solar system orbit the sun will spiral outward toward Mars give it a gravity assist to boost at the planet Mars. You see the blue dots here. Those are the times where we're going to try to test the deep space optical communication. So we'll try and test whether you can actually use laser communication all the way out to Mars orbit and beyond. We'll continue thrusting on and off as the spacecraft moves outward through the asteroid belt to catch up with Psyche in January of 2026, where we'll start a 21 month mission orbiting the asteroid at several different orbits, each one decreasing in altitude to give us better resolution on our instruments through the end of 2027. It's gonna take about 3.4 years to get out there. So how are we getting out there? You've heard me mention the term ion propulsion. This is a type of technology that's been used on several NASA missions, including the Dawn mission. It's what the builders of our spacecraft, uh, Maxar Technologies use on their Earth orbiting satellites. Basically, you take a low mass fuel like xenon, you use uh, electricity from the solar panels to ionize it, and then you, you uh, thrust it outward uh, based on repelling through an electric field, and that produces thrust. The advantage is, is that this is a very low mass fuel, uh, so it reduces the cost uh, and, and the mass of the mission. The drawback is it takes longer to get where you're going than you, if you used a heavy chemical propellant. So that's why it's gonna take uh, 3.4 years to get out to the asteroid. So this just shows you the different orbits. You know, we start with orbit A um, and that's where we start searching for the magnetic field and do our initial imaging of the surface. And then with each orbit from B to C to D, we drop down, we get uh, data that's gonna be good for all of our instruments, uh, both imaging data, compositional data and gravity and topography data. So over here, you see, once again, this is just a statement of all of the different orbits, and I'm not gonna read what's here, but the things to note in the color here is that the resolution of our cameras gets better as we drop down to each orbit. Uh, just for comparison, the best resolution of the Dwarf Planet series we got with the Dawn mission was at 35 meters per pixel during its nominal mission. That's the worst that we're gonna get here at, uh, at Psyche we're gonna get really good resolution about four to five meters per pixel in the final uh, orbits of the mission when we get data for the gamma ray and neutron spectrometer. 
So I mentioned these instruments. Let me tell you a little bit more. It's not just one place building all of this. This is a very much a team effort involving scientists from all over the world. Uh, this is basically just three instruments on the Dawn mission to study asteroid 16 Psyche. The multispectral imagers, which we're leading here at ASU, being built by our contractor, Malin Space Science Systems in San Diego. So these cameras will take pictures of the surface of Psyche with a broadband clear filter and seven color filters. And so that'll give us the, the morphology, the shape of the surface. We'll be able to use it to do stereo topography to give us elevation. And the color filters will show us what it looks like in color and also will help us determine whether we have minerals there consistent with silicates or sulfides. Things that we, and sulfides are important with metal uh, objects. The magnetometer is led by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. It's been built by the Danish Technical University near Copenhagen, Denmark. It can measure magnetic fields down to 0.1 nanotesla. And these are actually two fluxgate magnetometers that are on one of those booms I showed you. The gamma ray and neutron spectrometer is built by the Applied Physics Lab at Johns Hopkins University. And as I said, they can give us the elemental abundance of the different parts of the surface, the amounts of iron and nickel and silicon and a whole bunch of other elements, as well as tell us if there's any hydrogen indicative of water ice there. And then finally, the whole spacecraft is gonna be used to conduct a gravity experiment. You can actually study the way that the, the radio signals from the spacecraft behave when the spacecraft flies over areas of greater mass and less mass. And from that, you can peer into the interior and determine what the interior structure of the asteroid is. So the Psyche mission has been going on for quite a while in the development phase. It was first discussed in 2011. The proposal that when NASA announced that our mission was selected was in January of 2017. So you, hear, you see here along the bottom, and we are here at the end of 21. We are in a phase called ATLO, which means assembly, testing, and launch operations. That's finishing building the spacecraft and getting it all ready to ship to Cape Canaveral in Florida for launching in August of next year. So these are just some more artist drawings of what the asteroid may look like. This one, you can see it's got a lot of metal uh, exposed, whereas the one on the right is where the metal and the silicates are more intimately mixed up into it. And Psyche could be any one of these things. Uh, we just don't know. That's why we're going to find out. And the way that you figure out among all these different possibilities is by not looking at data from just one instrument, but by combining them from all the instruments. We're gonna look at the magnetic field. We're gonna look at the nickel content of the surface. We're gonna look whether it has uh, sulfide minerals like troilite. We're gonna look at the, at the topography, the amount of impact craters. And by putting all of this information together in decision trees, we'll be able to determine which of those options of its formation actually occurred. For me as a geologist, I'm really interested in what the geology will look like on a world made out of metal. Here's an example of an impact crater where a metal ball was shot into an, an iron metal target using the vertical gun at NASA's Ames Research Center. And you can see it formed a crater, but you see it's like its rim is like frozen. It's like the ejecta frozen the metal out there as, as it was forming. So is it possible that impact craters on Psyche could look something like this? This is one of the things we're gonna find out. So as I said, right now, this fall, we're in ATLO at, at the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena. And here you see a picture of the spacecraft after it was shipped there from Maxar Technologies. And you can see the fuel tanks on the interior. These are the base plates for the imager. These are the booms. And you can see the magnetometers were already installed. And this boom here is where the, the uh, neutron spectrometer and the gamma ray spectrometer have been installed. So it's all coming together as we continue to, to uh, finish building and testing the spacecraft as the mission goes on. So before I get to my conclusions about Psyche, let me talk a little bit about the wide range of NASA missions that are going on. This graphic shows the planetary fleet and you see the dedicated missions to the moon and Mars and then throughout the solar system. Now, can you guess how many of these missions that ASU is involved in? Well, the next version, I put circles around the missions that ASU is involved in, and you can see we're involved in quite a lot. Um, you know, I've mentioned Psyche, which is getting ready for launch next summer. The Europa Clipper, which I think is launching in 2025. Professor Christensen has an instrument on board, which will be a, a mission to study Jupiter's icy moon Europa. I'm funded to help do some research on data from the Juno mission, the Jupiter Polar Orbiter. 
Uh, the European Juice Mission, Professor Jim Bell and I are co-eyes on an Italian-built camera on that mission, which will also launch, I think, around 25, 26. Uh, the OSIRIS-REx, uh, the sample return from asteroid Bennu, Professor Christensen had an instrument on that. Um, over here, Lucy, which just launched uh, in October, October 16th it launched, and uh, that is going to study the Trojan asteroids. Moving over here to Mars, we see Luna Map, uh, Professor Craig Hargrove's instrument, which will go up on the first SLS launch later this year. Uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, Professor Mark Robinson's uh, uh, cameras are operating on that particular mission. And all of the different Mars missions, Rick just talked about the cameras on Perseverance and Curiosity rovers, which are just operating. Professor Minnie Wadawa involved with helping design the Mars Sample Return Program. Uh, Professors Christensen, uh, Steve Ruff, involved with Mars Odyssey. I'm involved with Mars Express. So there's a lot. And, you know, I'm helping a team from the New Horizons mission make the first global geologic map of Pluto. So there's just a lot, lot going on. And we'll probably become an, even more involved in some of these missions. The DART mission, I should point out, is scheduled to, its launch window opens on November 24th. That's happening this month, as well as the Hubble launch coming up. So, um, and here it is. You just heard them talk about that in the previous presentations. The Hubble launch scheduled for December 18th, I believe. And uh, I encourage you to look back and, and look at uh, some of the exercises we get ready for that launch. So in conclusion here, uh, asteroids are the rocky remnants from the formation of the solar system. On January 4th of 2017, NASA selected Arizona State University to lead the Discovery Class robotic mission Psyche to visit the M-class asteroid 16 Psyche. Like the Dawn mission before it, the Psyche spacecraft will use solar electric ion propulsion to move through the solar system. Psyche will carry three instruments, a visible imager, a magnetometer, and a gamma ray and neutron spectrometer to study the asteroid. The Psyche spacecraft, uh, it was built at Maxar and is being continued building at NASA Jet Propulsion Lab where the instruments are being installed and tested in what we call ATLO. The launch date is scheduled for August of 2022, and there will be a 3.4 year cruise phase and uh, before we actually get out to 16 Psyche. And we're getting really excited. This paper uh, by Shepard et al 2021, this is based on Earth-based telescope. And this is the best view we have of Psyche right now. You can see it's potato shaped. It looks like it's got dents in it, probably from a bunch of impact craters. And there's areas that are brighter and darker as this map uh, looks down here. So we're really, excited to see that. And with that, I'll stop now, stop sharing, and I will take any questions that appears in the chat. So thank you. And Thanks, I'll open, I'll open the Q of A here. Um, uh, from Alexandra, would iron meteorites provide us information about Earth's core? Uh, that's entirely possible. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different families of iron meteorites that have been discovered. We have quite a few of them. Examples of them in the Center for Meteorite Studies here at ASU, the largest university-based meteorite collection in the world. Um, and yeah, so they, there is, there, there's potentially insight about that. We think that the iron meteorites come from different uh, metal asteroid families. And so that's one of the goals of the Psyche mission to help improve our understanding of those. Paris asks, how does the Psyche mission compare with the OSIRIS-REx mission to Bennu? Uh, the Psyche mission is, an, uh, is a discovery class mission designed to be an orbiter of Psyche. The OSIRIS-REx mission, it was an orbiter and sample return mission from uh, near-Earth asteroid Bennu, which was a lot closer. It was actually what we call a New Frontiers class mission. That's the medium size. So you've got discovery is, quote, small, and then New Frontiers is medium size, and then flagship class missions like the Europa Clipper um, are the really huge and expensive ones. And then you have the smaller than small, you have the CubeSat missions and the SmallSat missions and Luna map is one of those. And you'll hear more about that uh, later. Uh, and then Steven asks, can the Psyche probe land on the asteroid? What happens after the mission concludes? Yeah, that's a good question. It's not designed to land on the surface when our primary or nominal mission ends, if there's still resources on the spacecraft, if we can still generate power, if we still have fuel, um, we will probably drop lower uh, to study the surface even more closely. And after that, who knows, if we still have resources left over, we could either depart Psyche and go somewhere else in the asteroid belt, or 
we may try and do what the NEAR mission did to asteroid Eros back in the early 2000s and sort of slowly crash landed on the surface. So whether that happens, you know, that decision will be made depending on how the Psyche nominal mission goes. So I don't see any more open questions and I see it's 1130, so we're right on time. So I'll just say thank you very much for participating. I look forward to seeing you all in person on ASU Open Door. The Greeley Center will be open in the Bateman Physical Sciences Center F-Wing uh, during Open Door. And uh, we'll see you then and enjoy the rest of the presentations here at Earth and Space Exploration Day. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share our next QR code. So if you're collecting those, um, get your camera ready and we'll leave that up for just a moment. And then I'm gonna hand it off to Alicia for our next group. Thank you so much your phones out ready to go. Um, thank oops, there we go. <laughs> With that being said, um, I'm excited to announce our next group is the Cosmology Research Group, which features several students um, and faculty and staff. So, but tonight or today, we have Liam Nolan, Rosalia O'Brien, and Delandra Carter here to present. Uh, so I'm going to hand it off to this wonderful team who's going to tell us more about their group. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Delandre Carter, and I'm presenting with Rosalia O'Brien and Liam Nolan. Uh, I'm an astrophysics PhD student here at ASU, first year. I study distant galaxies, working on projects Sky, Surf, and Spherex uh, with professors Roger Windhorst and Phil Moskoff. And today, the three of us are going to be talking about the Hubble JWST related work that our group does here at ASU. Next slide. So first, I want to give a brief overview of the topics we're going to be discussing today. First, I'm going to be giving a brief discussion of the Hubble Space Telescope and some of the projects we're working on here at ASU, uh, namely Project SkySurf, that are using Hubble data for our work. And then Rosalia is going to follow up with a talk about the James Webb Space Telescope, how it's going to improve and build upon the work that we're doing with Hubble. And lastly, Liam is going to give a fun demo of a tool called Appreciating Hubble at Hyperspeed, which is a neat little tool that allows users to travel through the Hubble Ultra Deep Field um, at speeds greater than the speed of light. Next slide. So a, few, a little bit of background about the Hubble Space Telescope. It's been in operation since 1990. It's an optical telescope. And what that means is the light it observes is primarily the same as the light that we observe. So not, uh, so not necessarily in infrared or uh, other spectrums. It has a 2.4 meter mirror, um, and it also has instruments in UV, visible and IR, though the primary mirror um, is for the visible spectrum. And it's a telescope that's designed to be maintained while in space. It's basically the same as the telescopes we use here on the ground, but in space. Next slide. And one of the most fascinating pictures Hubble has ever taken um, is a picture called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And when you look at this picture, you might initially be thinking, wow, that is a lot of stars. And you would be right. But there's also a lot of galaxies here. And in fact, each of the splotches of light you see in this image is a galaxy with the exception of a few select sources. And this image was taken of a portion of the sky that's about the same size as your thumbnail if you were to extend out your arm. And we stared at this little piece of sky for 11.3 days just to be able to observe the galaxies in this image. And to put into perspective how faint that it, that is, these galaxies are, it, it's comparable to trying to observe a firefly on the moon. And next slide. And that leads into uh, Project SkySurf. The main question we're trying to answer is, broadly speaking, where is all the light received by the Hubble Space Telescope coming from? Next slide. And the reason we want to know where all the light is coming from is because, as it turns out, about 95% of the light Hubble receives comes from within the orbit of Jupiter. 
that means that only 5% comes from light from the rest of the universe. Light that is directly related to cosmic star formation, planet formation, galaxy evolution, and a variety of other different topics. And by studying where the light is coming from, uh, being able to measure it accurately, um, including the foreground light and the extra galactic background light, we can gain insight into these topics. And now I'll, leave, I'll hand things off to Rosalia to talk about the James Webb Space Telescope and the ways uh, it could build, up, build off of the work uh, we are doing and will be doing with Hubble. Hi, yeah, thanks, Dre. Um, yeah, um, my name is Rosalie O'Brien, like Dre said. Um, I work for both Professor Roger Windhorse and Dr. Rolf Jansen, who gave the keynote talk um, on a couple different projects. And I'm hoping to give you guys an idea of how James Webb will help us here, specifically at ASU. Um, so to recap, uh, James Webb, or JWST, is widely known as the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, and it will be viewing light in the infrared. So this just means that James Webb is going to be looking at light that is literally redder than what Hubble can see, um, which will allow us to see things we weren't able to see with Hubble, which is very exciting. Um, it's a 6.5 meter telescope which means just one of these gold sexagonal mirrors you see on this figure is about four feet long. So this is a really big telescope um, and it's launching in about a month, which is very exciting. Um, and we think it's gonna really launch a new era of astronomy. James Webb, which Rolf talked about, um, has a lot of science goals, um, four main ones. The first and most exciting to me is that it's going to see the very first stars and galaxies. And this is because it's an infrared telescope. It's going to see farther away than we've ever seen before and really get to probe these elusive, really far away objects. Um, with James Webb, we're also hoping to learn how galaxies evolve over time, learn how stars and planets are born. Um, and James Webb is also hoping to study exoplanets and maybe start to unravel how life came to be in the universe. Um, and again, it's able to do all of this because it is an infrared telescope. So we're gonna be seeing things we weren't able to see with Hubble, but with the same or better resolution than Hubble. So I'm part of two projects here at ASU. One is called Sky Surf and one is called Treasure Hunt. Um, both of which will greatly benefit from James Webb data. So like Dre said, SkySurf, we're just trying to study where all the light in the universe is coming from. So here is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, um, which Dre actually just showed, which is really famous because we were able to see farther back in the universe than we had ever seen before in images like this. Um, and although most astronomers, when they look at an image like this, they'll study the actual galaxies in the image. What me, Dre, and other people on the SkySurf team are interested in is actually these regions that I circled in red that look dark, um, but we are actually still receiving light in these dark regions. And we don't really understand where all this light is coming from. How James Webb will help us with this, if I go to the next slide, if James Webb were to look at this same region in the sky, that Hubble did, we might see something like this, where the regions that were dark before, we can actually see galaxies there now that are so far away that Hubble couldn't see them, but James Webb can. And this can help us greatly understand where exactly all this stray light is coming from. Um, the other project I'm a part of is called Treasure Hunt. Treasure Hunt is a project led by Dr. Rolf Jansen where we are pretty much doing preliminary observations of a field that we hope James Webb will look at a lot in the future. And we're doing those preliminary observations with Hubble. Um, the reason this is really helpful is because James Webb and Hubble can see different things within galaxies. So this figure on the right, you can actually see the Milky Way, so our own galaxy at different wavelengths, like infrared, mid-infrared, or optical. What Hubble sees is something like the bottom row when it looks at the Milky Way. But what James Webb will see is something like the second or third row. Um, and you can see it's very clear that each row, so each wavelength, you're seeing very different things from within the Milky Way. 
if we extrapolate the same idea and look at other galaxies, we're going to see things within galaxies that we were never never able to see with Hubble. And we'll be, we'll be able to understand these galaxies pretty much to a whole new level. Um, another big part of this treasure hunt program is studying things like time variable objects, so things that vary over time. And this can include supernova or brown dwarfs. And with that, I'll actually give it over to Liam. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosalia. Um, so I am going to now share my screen uh, to show you all the uh, AHA tool. And I promise this is going to be the last acronym that we throw at you today uh, from our group. But AHA stands for Appreciating Hubble at Hyperspeed. Um, and actually, I did not optimize for video. So to give you all the best viewing experience, um, I'm going to do that. Uh, so this is AHA. And it probably looks a fair bit like the um, uh, Hubble Ultra Deep Field image that you all were shown earlier. You can see all these little splotches of color all over the place. Um, just checking because my my Zoom kind of disappeared. You, you all can see, correct? Yeah. Cool. Yep. Excellent. All right. So you can probably see all these different splotches of color that Delandre told you earlier are different uh, spots of galaxies. And that is completely true. And they might be a little harder to see right now, but that's because they're a little further away. And I'm going to show you what I mean in just a second. So I'm going to double click on this galaxy and we're going to see what happens. I think that's pretty cool. We're going to fly through this image up to this galaxy and be able to get a much better view of what is here. And the really cool thing is that we can actually do this many, many times. We can fly from galaxy to galaxy and get a really close view. And you can actually do this on your home computer if you want by downloading the tool at aha.asu.edu. Another thing we can actually do is click on an individual galaxy and get some information about it. Some of this might be a little confusing, so I'm going to walk you through what all these different pieces mean. So here, we're actually showing the object ID, which is just a number that classifies the different galaxies, the redshift, which I'm going to talk about in just a second, and then the co-moving radial distance, which basically is just another measurement of where something is in the sky. Uh, and then there's the stamp size, which is talking about how big the thing is uh, when we're looking at it. So I'm going to reset the simulation real quick and tell you a little about all the different information which is scattered around the screen. You can see up in the top left corner, we have an X, a Y, and a Z. And basically, the X and the Y, as we move, is going to change and tell us how far we've moved sort of in a, um, in a, in a left and right and up and down fashion from the center of the image. But the Z is what I find really interesting. The Z is what astronomers call redshift. And if you were here for Dr. Jansen's talk earlier in the presentation, uh, the morning, uh, you heard that redshift is essentially when you have light that is very far away from us getting stretched out as it moves through space. And the really cool thing about this is astronomers are able to use that measurement in two different ways. The first way is that we can tell that because it gets stretched out more when it's further away, we can tell how far away objects are based on how much their light gets stretched. The other way, though, is very interesting in that if you think about it, light, you probably know, can only travel at a certain speed. That's called the speed of light. Einstein talked about it a lot. And because light travels at a certain speed, it takes an amount of time from when a source of light emits that light and when you can receive it. So if you think about it, when something is really, really far away, like some of these galaxies, it's going to emit light and we're going to see that light a fair amount of time later. So we are actually seeing these galaxies a lot earlier in their histories than present time. What that means is, is that these galaxies that are very, very far away give us a picture into what the universe looked like a lot earlier in its history. Now, this tool is also very important to me personally, and this is where I'm going to give a little of my personal background, in that uh, I'm an undergraduate here at the School of Earth and Space Exploration studying astrophysics, physics, and French. And uh, I work under both Roger Windhorst, the leader of our group, and Rolf Jansen, who gave our keynote. And I work on a lot of different projects here, but one that I've been very privileged to work on has been um, I actually wrote a paper and designed a study around this tool, AHA, and its use in the classroom. And uh, I am the PI of that study. And after writing that 
uh, we actually submitted it to an astronomy journal and it's uh, been peer reviewed and accepted for publication uh, by the end of December. So I'm very lucky in that here at CC, I've been able to, even as an undergrad, do it, become a published, published author. And that's a really cool opportunity. So I really love this tool and how it can engage people across uh, different uh, areas of science, um, just because it's such a cool way of being able to fly through the universe. And I really hope that you take some time to try checking it out on your own computer. And that pretty much wraps up uh, my portion of this talk. And I think we'll all be very excited to answer any questions you might have. Okay, so Liam, there is a question here. Um, and it's from Steve, and it says, if funding becomes available, should Hubble be supported so its research can be continued? Should NASA develop a small version of the space shuttle to maintain Hubble and the web telescopes? And he says, thank you, excellent presentation, tremendous academic programs at ASU in Earth Sciences. That's a really great question. And there's sort of a, a multifold answer, I think, to it. Uh, first of all, it's actually really hard on the little James Webb part of it, because of course that's what we're focusing on this morning. Um, it's gonna be really difficult to service James Webb. I'm actually gonna stop my screen share for now. Uh, and that's because it's actually much, much further away than Hubble is. Hubble orbits the Earth in a fairly close orbit, but Webb is gonna be a lot further away at the Lagrange point that Rolf talked about earlier. In terms of servicing Hubble, well, there's pros and cons. Uh, you really have to be to think a lot about where you're wanting to place resources and invest uh, what your effort is going toward. Um, and some tools can eventually outlive uh, how useful they're going to be for how much energy you'd have to put into maintaining them. We've gotten a lot of incredible data out of Hubble, and it's been an incredible revolutionary tool in the field. But eventually, you know, just like, you know, a hammer or, uh, you know, uh, uh, drill, eventually those tools are going to wear out. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that excellent presentation. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here for another QR code. So if you're collecting them, this is now the time to get your phone ready. And we're going to share that. Um, but thank you to the Cosmology Group for that great presentation. And with that, I'm going to get ready to introduce our next group, which is going to be Dr. Impact, which will be Mara and Leah. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for introducing us, Kim. Um, my name is Mara. I'm a grad student here um, in CC at ASU. Um, my research studies meteorites that record the impact history of our solar system, and we're going to be talking about impacts today. But joining me also is Leah here. Leah, did you want to introduce yourself? Sure, yeah. Um, my name is Leah, and I also work with Tom Sharp. I'm a first year grad student in CC, and my research focuses on using the minerals that are changed by impacts on Earth to try to find out when those impacts happened. Can everybody so both, see the presentation? Yeah. yeah great. Great. Yep. So we're both impact people. I do space impacts. Leah does terrestrial impacts. And we're just going to get into some impact experiments and how we can understand what we see on Earth and how that relates to space. OK, so we're going to start by talking a little bit about Meteor Crater. This is the nearest confirmed impact crater to where we are right now. Um, it's just east of Flagstaff, maybe like 40 miles drive. Um, and it's pretty small. It's about a kilometer. Uh, in diameter. It was formed about 50,000 years ago. And when people discovered it, it was named Meteor Crater because the nearby post office was the Meteor Post Office. And it was common practice at the time to name ge geologic features after the post office that was closest to them. But actually, people thought that it was a volcanic feature um, because back then, people didn't realize that meteor craters occurred on Earth. They thought, you know, just on the moon and Mars and other places. Um, but it turns out we have them here too. So in the middle, um, you can see there's a bunch of white and that's remnants of when uh, people like a hundred years ago tried drilling into the crater to find pieces of the impactor. So they wanted to find pieces of meteorite that was iron and nickel rich. And they drilled for 
50 or 60 years and they really didn't find anything because it turns out that there's no big chunk of meteorite preserved in this crater. And this is still the point where people are wondering, is this volcanic? Is it a crater? Well, this guy up in the upper left corner, Eugene Shoemaker, was the first person to actually confirm that this is from a meteor impact. Um, and he did this when he was a PhD student, just like me and Leah. Um, and he discovered that this was actually a crater by comparing how it looks on the surface to um, atomic explosions that were done for experiments in Nevada. He said, hey, this looks like it's a high pressure um, explosion. Maybe this is from a meteor impact instead of a volcano. And he found a very special mineral that only happens at super high pressures and temperatures right in the center. And that confirmed that we know for sure it's a meteorite impact. And so now the next thing is, how do we simulate these things? It's great to be able to see the surfaces um, of these features at Meteor Crater and on planetary bodies. Can we simulate these things? And we can, that's what we're gonna get into today. So on the left-hand side, we've got a bunch of tools that we're gonna use for these experiments. We've got a bunch of different balls. Some of them are metal, some of them are wood, and we've got this, kind of slingshot thing. We'll get into that in a little bit. And then on the right hand side, we have a sandbox. Um, it's orange on the top and it might be different colors underneath. We'll see that coming up soon. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to take a look at is whether the size of the impactor affects the size of the crater. So if you guys have any thoughts on this, you can just type those into the chat um, and we'll kind of take note of them. But Mara, what do you think? Will that affect the size of the crater? Yeah, I don't know. I'm looking at these two balls, right? It's two kind of wooden looking balls. They look similar size, but one is definitely larger. So I think it'll affect it, but let's see. Yeah, and it looks like they're made of the same stuff too. Mm -hmm. So here we're dropping them from the exact same height. Okay, let's take a look at those craters. So it looks like the one on the right is a bit bigger than the one on the left and the one on the right had a bigger wooden ball. So we can actually measure the sizes of those craters and look at that. So the bigger one made a bigger crater. And it looks like some of the blue sand that must have been underneath that orange layer was lifted up to the surface or that orange sand was pushed out. So now we're seeing a layer underneath the surface layer. All right, okay, so, so now these two balls, totally different color, right? Well, they're different material. We've got two metal balls here and they look a lot smaller than the other ones. What do you think is going to happen with these? So I think that since they're made of different stuff and they might weigh a different amount for being the same size, that might affect the size of the crater that they make. Let's find out. Whoa. Yeah, that one's a lot bigger. Totally. So it looks like these made different sized craters than the wooden balls, but these metal balls were also different sizes than the wooden ones. So I'm not sure if we can directly compare them yet. Yeah, so we'll have to see. I mean, it looks like one of them definitely, we saw that blue sand layer underneath, but the other one's really hard to see. It still looks orange. So size definitely seems to be a factor. Let's see how much of a factor though. Okay, so now we have one metal ball that's a lot bigger than the earlier one. And then we still have the same small metal ball. I think that big ball is gonna make a really large crater, but we'll see. Whoa. Let's see if we can scroll back a little bit. Okay, so you can see the exact moment when that big one hits the sand. And you can see it's taking material and it's going out in all directions pretty far. 
Wow. This is the most blue sand we've seen so far. And the other one still, we are barely seeing any blue sand underneath. So this large metal ball made a huge crater compared to the small one. So I'd have to conclude that size of the impactor definitely matters for size of the crater. Look at that. Okay, so we did size of the impactor, but what about what the impactor is actually made of? Because we have these wooden and metal balls. Yeah, so it looks like these balls are relatively the same size, right? But like Leah said, one of them's wooden, one of them's metal. We've both already seen these craters, but not side by side. So let's take a look at what happens. We're still doing a drop test here. Okay, so the same size, but they're made of different material. Interesting. I think we can scroll back in this one a little bit too, right to the moment. So you see the wooden one hits and it looks like not that much material is being thrown out, but then the metal one hits and it does the same thing as before. It flings a lot of stuff out. So here we're looking at the ones on top. The top two craters are the ones that we just made. And the one on the left was made by the wood, the metal ball. The one on the right was made by the wooden ball. So it looks like the material does matter. Mara, what do you think about the material matters? I think that based on this, I would say that something that has a higher density, if we think about holding a metal ball in our hand versus a wooden ball, that metal ball that's higher density, even though it's the same size, made a way bigger crater. So I'd say size and density matter. I would definitely agree with that. So now we've got another factor, right? What if we make these balls go really, really fast towards the sand? Is there gonna be a difference in the size of the craters? If you guys have any ideas, feel free to type them into the chat. Mara, what do you think is gonna happen? Hmm, I don't know. I mean, I'm thinking about we have like the minimum velocity for things to even get in to our atmosphere is about like 13 kilometers per second. So that's pretty really fast. So I'm thinking that velocity is going to matter for sure. Yeah, I think so too. If something hits faster, I feel like it's going to make a bigger hole, right? Mm -hmm. And here we're going to simulate that with our rubber band slingshot and just brute arm strength. We'll see what we can do. Whoa, can we that get a solo a of that? For sure. Okay, so here's Tom launching the metal ball and then it hits. Look at that, that looks like a textbook picture. But then the metal ball bounces out and it looks like it makes another crater. Secondary crater, two craters for the price of one. So that metal ball is actually bouncing out because it's hitting the bottom of the tray because it's going so fast and then going over and landing somewhere else. So this actually happens. Like if you look at the moon, you'll see a lot of secondary craters next to bigger craters like this. All right, so we know higher velocity definitely makes a larger crater, especially looking at this one. What happens if the impactor is coming in at an angle? Let's find out. Whoa. Okay, so this one I think we don't need slow-mo for, but this crater looks quite a bit different than the other ones. Mara, how does it look different? To me, the shape of the crater looks pretty circular like the others, but I'm looking at the sand colors. They look totally different now. It's not a regular blanket. I can see the blue sand kind of on one side. Do you see that? Yeah, I definitely see that. And I think we even have an outline like this. So I think that if you look at craters on Earth or on the moon or something like that, you can kind of figure out the angle that the impact happened at based on where the ejecta went. So the ejecta is the stuff that kind of gets excavated out of the crater when it's formed. Yeah, and this is actually a tool that we can use on um, lunar surfaces to try to see relative age or when impacts happened and how they happened. And I think we talk about that next too, right? 
Yep, our next thing is relative ages. So if you already have one crater and then you make another crater, how can you figure out which one is younger? Let's see the video. Bam. So we clearly had a first crater and then this second ball hit right near it. And we can see an outline where the second crater that was made is almost overtaking that first crater that was there. And so we know for sure the second crater happened after the first crater. And this helps us understand impact history on planetary surfaces. So here's a question. You launched this big wooden ball pretty much just as fast as Tom launched the metal one earlier, but it didn't make a secondary crater. Why do you think that is? I think I'd have to go back to the material of the impactor. I had something that wasn't nearly as dense as that metal ball. And so it didn't go all the way to the bottom and jump out. And that has to do with the amount of energy that we're putting into an impact in the first place. So when you mention energy, I start to think, it seems like energy is what determines the size of the crater. So we know that the mass of the impactor is part of the equation. We know that the velocity of the impactor is part of the equation. So how do those things work together to make the size of the crater? So those things are working together because when we add them, we're putting this amount of energy in that's dependent on the mass and the velocity. And then that'll help us determine the crater size. And that also is what helps us determine um, information about impactors like Meteor Crater here. So for Meteor Crater, we can see um, we can glean some information here. How did it form? Well, based on the size, um, we know that the diameter of Meteor Crater is about 0.74 miles in diameter. The depth, we can measure that, and the rise. And from this, we can get information about the um, impactor and how large it was, all of those things. So we think that the impactor, the Canyon Diablo meteorite here, was about 160 feet when it came in and hit the Earth's surface. What's really cool about Meteor Crater is that it's a pretty small crater, so not the entire impactor was vaporized upon impact. So some little chunks of it remained, and in this area around the crater, people used to walk around and just find little chunks of meteorite. Awesome. If you have a chance, go visit Meteor Crater with all this new knowledge that you have here. And we're a little bit over time, so we'll pass it to the next group and answer any questions that you have in the question chat. Thank you so much for that impactful lesson on crater formation. Um, you know, I think we might have time actually to take one question if somebody would like. If not, uh, I will leave those in the chat for you as well. Um, but maybe we can ask just one. Have there been any new meteor craters on Earth? And how are incoming meteors detected? So that was from Stephen. Yeah, so we currently don't have any new-ish meteor craters, but to this day, we're still investigating some really large lake areas or anything that has this circular depression to see if we can evaluate whether or not it was um, formed from a meteor impact or not. Um, and then for uh, impactor detection, whether or not it's coming towards us or potentially a hazard, this is actually something that's on the mind of people at NASA right now. There are task force set to um, monitor the bodies that we have in space, make sure things are safe. Um, right now, I don't know if we have a plan set for what would happen, but Leah, did you want to add something? Yeah, um, so we actually are able to detect most incoming meteors and meteors that will pass close to the Earth, um, and only if they're above a certain size, though. So we're able to detect all of the ones that would cause regional or global devastation on Earth, but the ones that would just kind of make a hole and you know might cause some stress for the people living nearby, uh, we can't necessarily detect all of those. Sometimes we see them kind of as a side effect of detecting the larger ones, but this is definitely something that's an active area of research. 
Great, thank you so much for taking the time to answer that question. We really appreciate it. Uh, next in our section, we're gonna turn it back to our dynamic duo. We're gonna give it off or hand it off to Rick Allen and Alex Blanche to talk about Psyche, our, our Psyche spacecraft um, model that we have in the lobby. So Alex and Rick, if you are ready, I can go ahead and turn it over to you. It turns out we are ready. How's everybody doing? You guys have held up now through two hours of programming. I think that's really pretty cool. And we've both got about an hour left. In my interim, uh, my interlude this time, I wanna just talk a little bit more about how from an outreach standpoint, we're handling the Psyche mission. Just a little bit ago, you heard Dave Williams talk about the science of the mission. He showed you some diagrams of the spacecraft. He said what the Psyche mission is going to try to accomplish. I'm going to kind of just like walk you through what we're doing here in the building on campus to help people understand the Psyche mission, the spacecraft, the object, and, and, and things that are going. So uh, I'm going to show you a timeline, first of all, and uh, or Alex is going to bring that up. And I just want to talk a little bit about missions last for a long time. So this timeline you're seeing on the screen shows information from before 2016 as the, as the project was getting organized and, and understood. And then it takes us out past 2026. So there's more than a decade of information on this particular timeline. You see up in the left corner, there's a, a, a sort of a, the, the, some of the solar panels from the spacecraft and up in the right corner is the object itself or what we think the object looks like. I want to focus you right into the middle, what we call phase D. That's where we are today. And you can see that we're just sort of just before 2022 um, and we're right in the middle of this phase D's. What we're looking for next is that the space draft will move to its launch in um, a launch facility in Florida. But I'm going to just focus you over to a little video right now. Let's, let me show you this real quick. <clears throat> this is actually the spacecraft arriving in Pasadena at JPL. So what happens here is that the spacecraft bus was built and constructed up in San Jose. And then at it gets to a certain point, it's going to go down to uh, Pasadena. They're unloading it here in what's called the high bay room, uh, one of the high bay clean rooms. And here, just like I was talking about the last mission, Perseverance, the instruments are all going to be put on, added, wired, tested, and, uh, and integrated, as they say in the, in, the, um, in the thing. This just repeats. There's the big truck and bringing it in. We'll go back to me here. I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing here to get people ready for this mission. In the background, you see that spacecraft. And that big, huge, white, uh, whitish dish there is what we call the high gain antenna. The two, the three major features on the spacecraft bus that are very recognizable is that particular big dish. The two masts, they're black in this particular picture. They stick out kind of the top part of the spacecraft. And then the central box, the sort of the cubicle shape that's going to hold all the mechanisms, the propulsion systems and all of that stuff. We decided a couple of years ago to try to actually represent this life size. Uh, we think that's important. Uh, the Perseverance rover model we have in the room is life size. People are amazed when they walk up to it and see how big these things have to be uh, to go and deliver the science they're going to do. We also have satellites that I can hold in my hand, just sort of small uh, vehicles and, and spacecraft that will fly and do local missions. This is how big this one has to be. And you remember the solar panels that you saw in that other view. When it is all stretched out, when it is all put together, it's about the size of a tennis court. For the next couple of months, we're going to be outfitting this particular model with about 30 instruments uh, thing and propulsion systems and communication systems. So all the little devices and things are going to stuck to the edge of this box and make that happen. Let me show you a little bit another model of the actual uh, 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 what we think the object looks like it's because Psyche is both the name of the mission, uh, the Psyche spacecraft is the name of the, uh, the, uh, the device behind me. Uh, Psyche, the asteroid, is actually uh, an asteroid in the outer part of the asteroid belt, and we know not very much about it. There's many models you'll see that sort of show it pretty specifically. 
But in reality, we don't know until we get there some of the things we're looking at. We know it's a little bit oblong, potato shaped, not round. Uh, we know about its size. We know it's about the size of Massachusetts, we'd like to say, about 270 kilometers across at its long dimension. Uh, but really, what color it is or how cratering actually happens on the surface of an object that is very metal rich, we don't know a lot of that stuff. So we're going to have to get this spacecraft done. It's going to launch in August of 2022. So we're looking forward to that. And then we'll, we'll wait for the three years for it to get to the object psyche, the actual asteroid, and start sending back information. One of the exciting things about being part of a project like this, remember I was talking about uh, how we have principal investigators <clears throat> like Jim Bell is, a, is an investigator on the instruments that are on the Perseverance rover. Uh, Lindy Elkins-Tantons at Arizona State University is the principal investigator of this mission. She is the science lead. She's only the second women, woman in history to actually be a science director for a major mission. And so that's pretty exciting for ASU and really for the state of Arizona. There's another aspect of this mission that, uh, or the, the outreach for this mission that Lindy brought to the table and said, you know, we should do this. And it's actually about inspired artwork about the Psyche mission. It's the project is called specifically Psyche Inspired. You can look at a website and sort of like learn about it and learn about what's happening. But this particular mission has inspired artists, musicians, uh, sort of uh, composers, uh, all kind of poetry, all kinds of things kind of looking into the mission itself. I just brought a couple of, of canvases out. This one shows Psyche, the spacecraft. You see way up here in the corner is Psyche, the asteroid, and it's labeled home. And the artist here is sort of describing uh, an instrument that we're making to send home back to Psyche. And so I think that's really inspired. And then down at the bottom, it says, I'm psyched to go home. I think that's really cool. Uh, there's another one here. I like this one as well. This particular artwork was also conceived by students that are working in the Psyche Inspired program. Here you see the iron asteroid, iron rich asteroid, as if it's the core of a bigger planetary system. So the big arc around the other side over there has the trees and the surfaces and the, and the things that are on the surface of the planet, but embedded in there and exposed and opened for our view is actually the metal rich core that was maybe the beginning of a planet that got destroyed in its early life. So Psyche is inspiring. Uh, Psyche has a lot to bring with it. It's a very complex mission and uh, we're using the opportunity here to sort of build a spacecraft, talk about it, and, uh, and have people learn about this exciting project as it goes along. But we're doing this as that 10-year timeline of how a mission develops, how a district gets organized, and how we get out into space uh, is all happening behind us. So, so that's going to be the end of this particular interlude. I'm going to see you again at about one o'clock. We've got much more presentations to show you. And uh, when I come back, we'll be inside the amazing Marston Exploration Theater. Okay, I'm going to turn it back over. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. And it's about that time again. Just get your phones ready. It's time for another QR code. So with that, and I'm going to call up our um, next group of presenters, which is really meeting some of our docents and Marston theater workers, which would be Justin Baez, Alex Blanche, and Alicia Hyatt. And we're just going to take a minute to meet them because when we do reopen, we will be back in them in person. And these might be some of the people that we see um, or that you have a chance to meet and talk to. And so I'm going to start my screen here and I'm gonna welcome the team here. Hi, Justin. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm trying, to, I'm trying to spotlight everybody and I'm not sure that I'm doing a very good job here, but- I think um, it'll transition as we each speak, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so there we go. Um, and then I don't know, I think I've lost my own video here. <laughs> I will spotlight you, Kim. Oh, you go. There we go. Great. Thank you. 
or maybe not. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's not really about me. It's about you guys. Um, so anyways, I just wanted to, to just take a minute and just, um, just let the audience um, kind of get to know some of the people that they see in the Marston Theater. And I'm going to start with you, Justin. So if you can just kind of introduce yourself and tell me what your major is. And then I'll also throw in a little tidbit that you were the first person I met on my first day when I started at C. <laughs> yeah, that was a that was a nice, um, I think that was in the spring of um, 2020. Yeah, it's spring 2020. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so hi everyone. My name is Justin. I am a fourth year student. I'm a third this is my third year at um, CC as a docent. I major in geology and my minor is in biology. I focus on two, two of those concepts so I can understand um, past life that lived on earth, um, such as paleontology and everything that every um, life that comes along um, with the geologic time scale. And Alicia? Hi, I'm Alicia Hyatt. I studied astrophysics and biological sciences, and now I am a staff member. Um, and my title is education outreach researcher. I think I'm missing a word in there, um, but I'll, I'll learn it one day. So I'm very excited to be here. Um, I've been here five years now. So um, yeah, you've probably seen me around. Yes. And Alex? Uh, hi everyone. I'm been the guy behind the camera. My name is Alex. I'm a, I'm a junior here here at ASU. I'm studying astrophysics and minoring in physics and math. So I get to study things in space, what they are, how they form. Uh, I tend to focus mainly on really distant galaxies and how they help shape the universe the way it is now. Uh, I've been part of this program for about three years. I've been a part of our virtual night skies, and uh, you've probably seen me around too. <laughs> Yes, so yeah, and I have to say that uh, all of these students of ours, and at least now our staff member, um, they play a big role in our community outreach programs and what we do here. So um, I just wanted to take a minute and just uh, get to know you guys a little bit better. And um, Justin, I understand that you did a really cool uh, internship last summer. Can you yeah. Talk about that? So my most recent internship was with the American Museum in Manhattan. And at that internship, I was able to understand the flying, the flying and landing mechanisms of bats. So I'm going to share my screen and show a really interesting video that um, that provides a unique perspective. Oh, didn't didn't um, maximize for uh, visuals. So this use, this shows a unique perspective on bat flight and how bats um, approach a roost to um, to land successfully without um, injuring themselves. So optimize your video. So right, right now we're looking at a um, phyllostomid bat, which is a leaf nose bat, and it's performing at something called a two point landing, where two of its limbs, its um, both its legs are um, are going to be in contacting the roost, which is on top of the ceiling. And um, I want to play the video and kind of um, take it from there. So the bat is approaching. This is in slow motion. It makes a somersault, and then you make the two contacts. So um, in addition to just a two-point landing, we also have three-point landings and four-point landings, which all have different force impacts. And we're trying to understand how that influences their ecology, their limb morphology, and other aspects that relate to um, its, um, its morphology as well as, um, as, well as um, perf performance in the, in the natural environment. So yeah, that was about it for, um, for my recent internship. <laughs> oh, that's really cool. So, and then you're graduating this year, right? Yeah, I'm almost out, almost out of the door. <laughs> <laughs> and then what are, what are your plans after? Are you going to go to grad school? Or are you? So this is a question I always ask myself every day, like, what am I going to do? And, you know, honestly, I think at the end of the day, I'm just excited to kind of get out in the world and apply what I know to to the, um, the real world environment, you know, getting away from the books and actually looking at, at rocks and uh, crops. But as far as the educational aspects of, of my of my trajectory, I am interested in pursuing grad school for um fields that connect um, paleontology to biology directly. So I'm um, like embryology, um, other things that have to do with development of, um, of organisms to understand phylogenetic um, um, connections between life um, from one organism to another. And then um, in the meantime, though, I am looking for um, research positions that are more like lab tech, um, lab tech um, careers, where I can um, look at um, I could look at um, certain measurements that are being taken by certain laboratories and get experience um, actually getting to know the research community before committing myself to a specific grad school program. Well, that sounds really great. So Alex, I'm going to toss it over to you. 
<laughs> oh gosh, what, are what? what are you working on? Because I know that you're you're you do a lot for us here, but I know that you're also part of the uh, One Horse Group and going to be watching the James Webb Space Telescope launch. Yeah, so the cosmology group that went earlier, I'm actually a part of that group. I work with Dr. Roger Wayne and Torres and some of the other researchers. Um, I I talked about studying distant galaxies, but I actually get to study um, galaxies and all their escaping radiation because. We believe some of that radiation actually affected the way our universe is now, and we want to know, you know, what caused those galaxies to or emit that radiation or not to. Um, so I get to do a lot of great research with that. Um, that's also in part with Arizona Space Grant, which I know has been talked about by some of our previous um, presenters. I'm also a part of that program. This is my second year. Uh, I, I, I got to say, just got to endorse it. It's a wonderful program. It's, you know, it's very streamlined to get students involved in a, kind of a professional workflow for research and as much as I do this for free, you also get paid for it, which isn't half bad. So, um, you know, the combination of that's really great. So I, I got to give a shout out to the space grant, um, that's ASU and Arizona Space Grant, which is wonderful. Um, and then also I get to do the wonderful work that I get to do here, which is as a docent and as part of a Martian theater tech. So I get to work in the theater and also do a lot of educational outreach, which I think is just so important for the sciences, because I think that's really where uh, we can really influence everything around us. So it's been so much fun. And, you know, this great gallery that we've been kind of walking through, Rick and I, uh, you get to see some of that. And I, this is kind of the work building. So it's very fun. But I get to study really distant galaxies in my research. And then I get to try and help explain that back here at uh, base camp. So uh, just just a great uh, few years uh, being a part of this whole experience and program, and both as a docent and as a space grant intern and as a researcher. So it's been a, been a lot of fun. Well, we're lucky to have you. Speaking of the theater and Alicia, so there I am. Also, also uh, Rick's right hand person that helps out in the theater. Can you tell us? Because soon we'll be back in the theater. Yes, uh, a little um, forewarning about the theater. No, so we we normally have our three D virtual events, right? Normally this is in person. We really love having an audience here and we like to tell you all about astronomy while you wear super fashionable 3D glasses. And unfortunately with the times we're unable to do that, but as Kim mentioned, Rick is going to be coming in a little bit later and we'll see what we can do. Uh, but with that being said, I help program that sort of program. I help make modules um, and data points for our computer system so that uh, field trips or public groups or whoever walks into our our theater um, gets to see a visually pleasing or aesthetically pleasing presentation. So I help with that, but also I've been cross-trained as a docent just as uh, Alex and Justin are. So I do, or I have given tours in the lobby and um, you know various other duties as assigned. So I help a lot with the technical side of uh, presenting, but also with the outreach um, side of of the theater as well. And so um, I did a little bit of research in my undergrad. I did my senior thesis with Dr. Heather Troop. I studied decomposition of mesquite leaves um, and, and soil and so on and so forth in the Santa Maria Experimental Range, which is close to the border of Arizona and Mexico. So um, I've had my hand in a lot of different jars, if you will. So, <laughs> well, we're Happy that you're here with us. And um, I just want to thank you for all three of you for taking the time just to meet with us so that when we do open back up and we're doing public programming again, there's some of the students that you see here. So stop in and say hello. And with that, Alicia, I'm going to hand it back to you to introduce the next group. So thank you. Thanks so much, thank guys. Thanks, everyone. Um, so with that being said, I'm very excited to announce our next presenter is going to be Jessica Swan with the Infiniscope uh, program. So we had a part one and here is our part two. So Jessica, if you're out there, we are ready for you. All right. Well, hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you today. Um, yes, I am Jessica and I am here from the NASA funded project called Infiniscope. Uh, Infiniscope is, uh, we focus on creating digital learning products. So if you haven't had an opportunity to check us out, just go over to infiniscope.org. What I'm doing right now is gonna test your knowledge on James Webb. So we're gonna use something called Kahoot. And what you're gonna need is your phone. So if you will grab your phone, I will get us ready to go. If you have never played Kahoot, 
Uh, once we get into the Kahoot system, it's literally a trivia platform. You will choose colors and shapes to represent the correct answer. And our top participant, our trivia winner, will uh, win some cool NASA uh, gift prizes. We'll call it that. So we have some really cool James Webb and NASA prizes. So grab your phone. I'm going to get us set up. And I will share. And of course, Kahoot is uh, taking a moment to load. My apologies. Gives you all time to grab your phone in case you haven't grabbed it yet. <laughs> Here we go. It should not be this difficult, but technology. There we go. All right. So what you'll need to do is go to www.kahoot.it. And once you go to Kahoot, you will be prompted to enter this game pen. And then you can create your name. So create your game name. And once we have all of our players in, we will get started. All right. Again, that's www.kahootit. Our game pen is 4035542. Give you all another, let's go 30 seconds to get logged in. So far, odds are pretty good. One more moment. Those last people in. And we're going to go ahead and start. Here we go. Our first question. Is, what is the name of the telescope being launched in December of 2021? Just choose the color or shape that you can identify with. Once we have all of our answers in, we have 18 seconds. What is the name of a telescope being launched? That is correct. It is in fact, James Webb Space Telescope. Let's find out who is currently at the top of our leaderboard. It is Lily. Congratulations, Lily. Still anyone's game. We have 10 questions left. Who developed the James Webb Space Telescope? Who developed the James Webb Space Telescope? Does anybody else feel like we need some Jeopardy music running in the background here? That would be amazing. I was just thinking that. <laughs> do, 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 do. Awesome. I love it. Keep it going. <laughs> here we go. The answer is all three space agencies it is in fact a uh, combined effort between NASA, ESA, and CSA. Let's see who is on our leaderboard. Oh, we have a couple of people moving up. We have the Rock Jockey and Shkermetti are moving up the board. Lily still in the lead. Question number three, approximately how much larger is Webb's mirror compared to Hubble? How much larger is Webb's mirror compared to Hubble? Yeah, 16 seconds left. This one's a tougher question. I can see it. Ten seconds left. Get those final answers in. Five. And 
Our answer is web is about seven times the area. Web has seven times the area. Let's see who is on our leaderboard now. Ooh, Rock Jockey has made it to the top of the podium. Got a couple of people moving on up. Question number four, how many segments make up Web's primary mirror? There's a hint for you on screen. How many segments make up Web's primary mirror? We have 15 seconds left. Is everyone is counting? And we have five seconds left. 15 answers in. And the correct answer is 18. 18 segments to Webb's primary mirror. Let's see what we have. And Jamma Jennifer has now moved up in the leaderboard. She is now top on podium. Number one, true or false? Question number five. James Webb Space Telescope is so big it has to fold just to fit into the rocket. True or false? Does it need to fold to fit into the rocket? True or false? We have 11 seconds left. Get those final answers in. Three. And the answer is true. We call it origami or origami fold into the rocket. Ooh, we've got somebody who's on a streak here. Namishka is on a streak. Jam and Jennifer still in the lead. Question number six, where will Webb orbit? Where will Webb orbit? Is a hint on the screen. Little hints there, here and there. And answer is about a million miles away at a point called L2. L2. All right, let's see how we're doing. Ah, uh, Namishka, definitely on a streak and now officially at the top of the leaderboard. Well done. Question number seven, what wavelength or type of light will Webb primarily observe in? What is the wavelength of light that Webb will use? primarily use keyword. Four wavelengths on the screen. 10 seconds left. Final answer is infrared. Well done, everyone. Well done. It is in fact infrared. And Namishka is still at the top of the podium, but we still have Lily and Jam and Jennifer. Still anyone's game? Question number eight. Which of the following is not true about infrared light? Which is not true about infrared light? Eighteen seconds left, maybe 10. Almost there. Let's see if our leaders are able to maintain their lead after this question. It, it can be seen with the human eye. We cannot see infrared with the human eye. That is correct. And, ooh, our leaderboard has changed. We have some people that are moving on up. Jay Fargola is on his way up or her way up. Next, true or false, Webb will be able to see further than Hubble, allowing us to look deeper in time. Webb will be able to see further than Hubble, allowing us to look deeper in time. True or false? We have 10 seconds left. Two, 
And here we go. True it is in fact true. We'll be able to see deeper in time, further back in time. And our leaderboard now shows, let's see, we still have the same top three on the podium. Question 10, we have two questions left. Which of the following will the James Webb Space Telescope study? What will we study? And 10 seconds left. The answer is all of them. You could have picked anything. We, in fact, will be studying all of these things with the Webb telescope. Okay, here we go. Oh, oh, Lily. Well done. Well done, Lily. All right, our final question. Are we ready? There we go. Final question is, where can you find out more information about James Webb Space Telescope? Where can you find more? You have 20 seconds to get that final answer in and see who is at the top of the leaderboard. Who is winning all of that cool NASA and James Webb stuff? Answer is any one of those. You can go to any one of these places to learn more about JWST or web. And our podium is well done. Our third place, our second place. Oh, that means first is Lily. Round of applause. Well done, Lily. That's amazing. So I'll tell you what, because we do have three and I have enough love to give. I'm going to pop my email address over into chat. Namishka, Lily, and Jay Fergola, if you will send me an email with your address, I will send you all of the stuff that we have planned for you. So make sure you guys all check out infiniscope.org. If you're interested in other cahoots like this, you can play with friends. If you want to, you can start your own game. You can check out all of our cahoots also here at Kahoot, we have multiple Kahoots to check out. We have stuff about moon phases and we have stuff about dinosaurs, Dino Doom. Um, so check us out, uh, play some games. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to you all. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jess. And it's that time again, it's the QR code time. So get your phones out, grab your, the QR code. And with that, I'm going to invite the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera team and the Shadow Chem team to come on. And I'm gonna stop sharing. And I'm gonna invite Aaron and Nick and Holly to come on. And we're going to have our next our presentation. Next presentation. Howdy, everybody. I'm Aaron Boyd. Um, I wanted to start by sharing a uh, photo of the science operations team for LROC and Shadowcam. This is last year's photo. You can tell because we're in Zoom land. Um, and so uh, the reason that I'm sharing this is because our team is made of a diverse group of people from all different kinds of backgrounds, from uh, business, to journalism, to uh, uh, computer science, mathematics, um, and geology, uh, among, and also engineering. So we have a diverse set of backgrounds and a diverse group of people. And uh, so um, to get into space and get into uh, working on a project um, like a NASA project that's orbiting the moon, um, the thing that really counts is enthusiasm. So uh, we have a pretty good group of enthusiastic people that are working. And uh, we're also pretty large teams. So um, we're able to tackle some pretty tough tasks uh, by putting everybody to work on the project. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention um, 
was that uh, it's the 10th anniversary of the uh, Apollo sample being added to the visitor gallery. So down here on the bottom left, we see the uh, visitor gallery um, and the moon rock is back here behind this red tape. Uh, on the right side here, you see a picture of what the moon rock looks like. This is over a 3 billion year old rock um, that was collected on Apollo 15. Uh, and that, that sample was revealed on EC Day, actually, back in 2011. So um, the display was revealed. And so our history walk, you can see where LRO is here next to the Memorial Union. So interdisciplinary A is where um, Science Operations Center is. And um, so our history walk is open now. And our visitor gallery, which is this uh, uh, area here where you can see uh, people actively targeting and downlinking from the spacecraft, um, that will be opening soon, uh, reopening soon. Um, and then I had a few videos that I wanted to share with you all. And anytime you guys can type in any questions, and we'll try to get an answer to you after our couple of presentations. Um, so feel free to go ahead and ask questions and we'll get those answers as uh, quickly as possible at the end of our presentations. So um, we'll start with something that uh, we do uh, at our Science Operations Center. So um, one of the things that we do is temporal imaging. So we look at the same place on the moon um, at much later in time. And what that allows us to do is look for changes on the surface that have occurred in that elapsed time between those images. So these are two different images taken with similar lighting conditions. And here you can see the new impact that was formed since that first image was taken. So you see these craters have quite an influence, even though the crater itself is fairly small, what it's uh, what it's influencing is actually pretty large. And here's another video. So you can see right away as soon as you look at the image, it looks quite different than what you would expect. So I want you to look around here and look at the different uh, terrain types that you can see and where there are craters and where there aren't craters. See that most of the craters look like they're on um, that area that looks similar to the surrounding mare uh, basalt. Most common rock type in the solar system. But there's a couple of different um, things going on. And there's some competing hypotheses, so we don't really know um, what the correct answer is. But uh, there's a lot of evidence to support that these are very young features. So um, volcanism on the moon being between 10 and 100 million years old is something that uh, is quite astounding. And so that's a discovery that we've made with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter 
And we've been in orbit since 2009, uh, taking pictures of the moon. There's uh, one more video here, and this one is narrated. Mount Marilyn is located on the boundary between Mare Tranquillitatis and Mare Fecunditatis. It rises 1,400 meters above the surrounding basalt plains and likely formed 4 billion years ago as a result of a large basin-forming impact event. Mount Marilyn was named by astronaut James Lovell after his wife during Apollo 8. It was called out on at least three Apollo missions as the astronauts passed overhead. Mount Marilyn is one of the most important and best known landmarks used for eyeball navigation, a critical check for the Apollo astronauts as they descend into the lunar surface. Many other Apollo era landmarks, like Mount Marilyn, appear in technical reports and maps, but many of these names are not officially recognized by the International Astronomical Union or the IAU. However, on the 26th of July, 2017, the IAU officially recognized Mount Marilyn as the name of this modest yet historic peak. Mount Marilyn will live on forever in the history of humankind's first step on another celestial body. And all of these um, videos and uh, other links are uh, available on our website. Um, that's lrock, L-R-O-C dot C-C dot A-S-U dot E-D-U. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to uh, Shadow King. Nick, you might be muted. Can you hear me now? Is this better? That's better. Yes. All right. Uh, so I'm Nick Estes. I'm the Science Operations Center Manager for LROC and Shadowcam. Uh, and with me, I have Holly Brown, one of our researchers. She uh, specializes in uh, investigating permanently shadowed regions, uh, which are going to be really important for ShadowCam. Uh, so we're just going to show a, a short video here to, to talk about what ShadowCam is all about and where we currently are in the, the project. And if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A section, and we'll be happy to answer them for you. The current focus of many missions returning to the moon are the poles. Why are the poles so interesting? Because of the small 1.5 degree tilt of the moon, there are areas near the poles that never get direct sunlight. These areas are called permanently shadowed regions, also known as PSRs. 
These PSRs are the best place to find volatile resources such as ice on the moon. By using overlapping images around the pole taken by the Elrock NAC at different lighting conditions, an illumination map can be built up showing areas that receive no direct sunlight. Because these areas are not illuminated, taking images of the surface is a difficult problem, especially from a spacecraft orbiting at 1.6 km per second at an altitude of 100 km over the surface. ShadowCam is a modified version of the successful Elrock NAC camera specially designed to take on these challenging illumination conditions. ShadowCam has a pixel scale of 1.7 meters and uses a time delay integration sensor also known as a TDI sensor. This type of sensor integrates much more light than a single line sensor to take advantage of light reflected off of craters rims or nearby peaks. This is known as secondary illumination. As an example, imagine yourself sitting in a dark movie theater. When the projector turns on, the light from the screen reflects back slightly illuminating the audience. This is exactly how secondary illumination works. The ShadowCam instrument and operations team is based at Arizona State University, working in the same facility that operates the LROC mission. And ShadowCam itself was built by Malin Space Science Systems in San Diego. After being built and calibrated, ShadowCam was carefully created and shipped to South Korea for integration on the Korea Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter, also known as KPLO. KPLO is the first lunar mission by the Korea Aerospace Research Institute known as KARI, and ShadowCam was selected as an instrument contribution for NASA to take part in the KPLO mission. ShadowCam has been mounted to the KPLO spacecraft and the spacecraft is now undergoing testing by KARI in preparation for launch in late 2022. Keep following news from shadowcam.sesc.asu.edu for more information on ShadowCam and KPLO as we prepare to peer into these shadowed regions for the first time. Yeah, so that's kind of an overview of the, the ShadowCam mission and, and where we're at. We're really excited to be taking part in this project with LROC. We've been able to look in high resolution at almost the entire moon surface, but those permanently shadowed regions because they don't get direct light are really challenging. And so with ShadowCam, we're going to be able to fill in that last gap to finally put together the picture of the entire moon. We're also excited to be part of Korea's first mission to the moon. Uh, which is always really exciting to see somebody else join lunar exploration. Uh, does anyone have any questions we can answer? We got one here from Stephen uh, Schreier. And it says, what is known of the moon's interior structure? Could any molten material still be found in the interior? And um, that is something that is still under speculation. And one of the reasons why heat flow uh, probes are very important on upcoming missions. But um, it is likely that the moon has a very small amount of molten core still. Um, and also, uh, if those imps are 10 million to 100 million years old, then it's likely that there are small pockets of molten material still in the mantle. So nothing like the vast 
uh, expanses from when uh, uh, Mare was erupting and uh, covering the whole, most of the surface. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's an ongoing question that uh, we're still investigating. All right, great question. Uh, so I think at, at this point, we can turn it back over to Alicia. Thank you so much to the wonderful LROC team for that informative presentation. Um, and keeping a long track here, next we're gonna play a very special video from the Center for Meteorite Studies. Um, and so here at ISTV4, we have the world's largest collection of meteorites held by any university. And what we're gonna do now is present to you a little inform informative video um, to talk more about that space. So we can go ahead and play that now. Welcome to the Center for Meteorite Studies at Arizona State University. My name is Dr. Devin Schrader. I'm the interim director of the Center for Meteorite Studies. And today I'm going to take you on a tour of the meteorite vault and through four and a half billion years of solar system history. Well, welcome to the meteorite vault of the Center for Meteorite Studies at Arizona State University. Uh, we have one of the world's largest meteorite collections that's based at a university in the world. Uh, we have specimens of over 2,000 distinct meteorites, and that's 2,000 distinct objects that were seen to either fall or were later found. And so falls are objects, uh, meteorites that are seen to fall, observed by someone and then later picked up. Fines are meteorites that could have been on Earth for a day, but was not seen to fall, or meteorites that have been on the Earth for millions of years and were later collected. Um, of those 2,000 distinct meteorites, we have over 40,000 individual pieces. So from some meteorites, we have hundreds of pieces from that fall or fine. Uh, other meteorites, we only have one piece. So meteorites can be categorized into three major types, stony meteorites, stony iron meteorites, and iron meteorites. So probably the most famous stony meteorite is the Allende meteorite, which fell in Mexico in 1969. Over two metric tons of material fell, so that gives scientists a lot of material to work with. This meteorite has been heavily studied and researched uh, at ASU and around the world, and I myself have also studied this meteorite. These are some large specimens that we have not cut and probably never will because uh, they're just beautiful and important historically. Uh, the one at the, on the top shelf uh, that you can see right now is still covered in mud and grass from when it first impacted the ground, so that's a pretty spectacular specimen. Uh, but to learn about the meteorite, we have to cut, polish, and look at the inside and analyze the individual components of the Andean meteorite. So now, I'll take you over to a slice of the Andean meteorite to get to see what's on the inside. So this is what the Andean meteorite looks on the inside. So we cut and polish it uh, with a diamond encrusted saw and then polish it down uh, to a nice mirror polish. And so you can see there's a lot of different objects in this slice. There's these large uh, white inclusions. Some of them look kind of funny like amoeboid. And then there's a lot of uh, kind of bluish gray material. First, I'll talk about the large white inclusions. Those are called calcium aluminum rich inclusions. And those are actually the first material to condense into a solid at the beginning of the solar system. So when the solar system was just hot gas and dust, these were the first solids that condensed out, just kind of like rain droplets condense out of a rain cloud. And so by dating these, we actually know how old the beginning of the solar system was. And work done here at Arizona State University concluded that these objects are 4.567 billion years old. So when you hear about how old the solar system is, studying these objects is how we know that number. The material in between the CAIs is a collection of chondrules. The chondrules are roughly spherical objects, uh, but in a slice, they look like circles. And these are objects that formed from uh, kind of little dust balls that were freely floating in the early solar system that were melted to high temperature to where they almost completely liquefied. And those form mostly after calcium aluminum inclusions until about 4.5 million years uh, after CAIs formed. And so we can study them to learn about the time after um, calcium aluminum rich inclusions formed. And then material in between the chondrules and the calcium aluminum rich inclusions, it's a bit hard to see, but everything that isn't a round little circle, uh, we call matrix, and that's fine grain material. 
And that's really fascinating to study. That was material that did not get up to those high temperatures that formed calcium aluminum rich inclusions or chondrules. And so in the matrix are preserved in some carbonaceous chondrites, which uh, Allende is a carbonaceous chondrite. Sometimes there's uh, organic material preserved, so not life, but organic molecules. And there's also objects called pre-solar grains, which are little uh, dust grains that formed around other stars before our solar system existed. Yeah. So next we have stony iron meteorites. And these are meteorites that come from asteroids that uh, got up to high temperature and melted uh, throughout the asteroid. And so heavy elements such as iron sank to the center of the asteroid, whereas lighter uh, things like rocky material uh, floated to the surface. And so stony iron meteorites, particularly this one, a palisite, we think represents the core mantle boundary in these melted meteorites, or these melted asteroids. And so here we have a nice mixture of stony and iron material. So this is the stony material. This is an iron magnesium silicate called olivine. And on Earth we have olivine, and it's a deep mantle uh, mineral. So by studying meteorites, we can actually help learn about uh, our own planet, about how our own planet may have formed. And then this shiny material is actually iron nickel metal. And so the core of an asteroid, we think, is going to be mostly iron nickel metal, uh, but these palisites are a mixture of iron nickel metal and this uh, deep mantle mineral olivine. So we think this represents the core mantle boundary of an early formed asteroid. So the last major type of meteorite we have are iron meteorites. And these are meteorites that also came from melted asteroids, asteroids that formed at the very beginning of the solar system with enough heat through radioactive decay to melt. So the heavy elements, like iron and nickel, sank to the core of the asteroid. And this meteorite, we think, does represent the remnant of an ancient asteroidal core. So the pattern you're seeing there, the crisscross patterns, is called the Widmanstatten pattern. It's actually the crystal structure of iron nickel metal. By studying it, we can learn about how slow um, this asteroidal core cooled. This one in particular, we think, cooled between um, around 10 degrees Celsius uh, per 1 million years. It took a long time to cool down from high temperature, about 1,000 degrees Celsius or more that it got up to. And so by studying these iron meteorites, studying these ancient asteroidal cores, we can actually learn about early planetary differentiation and what our own planet may have gone through during the first stages of uh, melting. And since we cannot get to our own uh, core on Earth, by studying iron meteorites, we can also learn about the core of our own planet. I'm Dr. Gemma Davidson. I'm a research scientist here in the Center for Meteorite Studies at Arizona State University. And in addition to meteorites from asteroids, we also have a large collection of samples from the moon, such as this uh, lunar meteorite here. This is Northwest Africa 5000. And we also have pieces of Mars. So this is a famous Martian meteorite uh, called Los Angeles. And then here in my hand, I have Martian meteorite. This is Northwest Africa, 7034. This is also known as Black Beauty. You see it's a very, very dark meteorite. It's also quite beautiful. And this is the only meteorite that we know of that is most representative of the Martian crust. So here what I'm holding in my hand is a piece of Mars's crust. And we've been doing a lot of research on this here at ASU in uh, collaboration with Professor Minakshi Wadwa, the director of the School of Earth and Space Exploration. I've been working on this sample to investigate water on Mars. So you may have heard that, you know, these different uh, robotic space missions have found uh, traces of water on Mars. Well, this sample gives us a chance to analyze that water in the lab. So in these different components of this meteorite, there's trapped very, very tiny amounts of water on the parts per million level so you know it's, it's a very dry rock but there is water trapped in the minerals there and we've been able to analyze that water to determine what the water composition of Mars's crust is and that can tell us about where Mars got its water. Thank you for joining us today for the tour of the meteorite vault at Arizona State University's Center for Meteorite Studies. We hope you enjoyed it and that you'll come visit us sometime in the future. Okay, thank you, Alicia and Meg for that. And I'm going to welcome Rick back and he should be in the Marston Theater now. It turns out you're right. I am back in the Marston Theater. So in the background, you see the earth that's on the screen. It's a 30 foot screen in our major uh, theater facility.
I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Marston Theater, and then I'm going to kind of bring some things to a close by showing you some of the things we can do in here that relate to some of the things we were talking about out in the gallery spaces and about the missions. So uh, in this particular place, it's a 3D movie theater. Let me put my glasses on. <clears throat> And so when you visit us and see the programming in this theater, we pass out glasses to everybody and all of the information you see on the screen behind me is represented in three dimensions. And so uh, things, planets and galaxies and objects just kind of float around in space in front of you and we can get uh, way, way out into space. There's over 2 million data points in this particular system so we can fly close to the moon. We can examine those ever, those shadowed craters in the bottom of the moon that Shadow Cam is going to go to. We can spread out to Mars and the outer gas giants. We can talk about the research that's going on here on those planets. Uh, and we can go deep, really cosmological into deep space and talk about the adventures of the exploration of the earliest parts of the universe, like those things that James Webb Telescope are going to bring us. So this gives us an opportunity to just put in real scale and in, um, in a visualization that really allows you with the glasses to fly the universe. We do our programming live. And so right now, Alicia is flying this particular show in the back of the You're not watching a movie we made for you. We're doing a presentation live that you can see in the background. And when you come here and visit us after the first of the year, remember, we're going to open in, um, in late February and in the late in the the middle part of the spring, uh, we want you to come visit. We want you to come see us. We want you to come see what we do in rooms like this and how we use this technology um, to do the outreach work that we do. I'm going to show you two things. One that kind of ties to the research that's going on upstairs. First, here's an image from Mars. Remember when we were at Mission Ops and I was showing you the cameras, Mass Cam Z, those two cameras that are on top of the rover? This image is actually two images combined one from the right side camera, one from the left side camera. And when we put this in the room and I wear my special glasses, it, it looks like you're on Mars. You see the foreground of this image and this sort of a distant and the distant mountains. You can move your head back and forth a little bit and the foreground shifts a little bit. It's absolutely amazing as if you could walk across the stage and move around on the surface of Mars and pick up rocks and things like that. So this is a way we can support what the rover is doing on Mars right here on campus. Let me show you another thing. We'll sort of move this image out of the way. Remember we were talking about Psyche, a journey to a, a metal world. We can actually sort of like uh, program such things into this particular system. Elise is flying us right back into our solar system so we can get into our galaxy. These are the nearby stars. They're going to form into the constellations that do this, but we can take objects like what we understand Psyche might look like now. We locate it in space exactly where it is now. We can talk about that mission and how we're going to launch and, and, and what we're going to do to actually get out to this particular object in space when we're operating when we're sort of in in in, in full operation uh, in the in our years before covid over 10,000 school age kids would come to our building with buses and buses of kids on Tuesdays and Thursday mornings and we would we would show them a, a program like this just inspire them to think big inspire to them to think about a universe that uh, that is still little understood right we're not trying to tell students these days we know everything about the universe we're trying to tell them what we don't know and what they get to sort of explore and experiment with just like some of the people you met today so i'm going to invite kim back to the screen here a little bit and uh well uh, while we're sort of flying to psyche and i just want to ask you kind of a question kim as we go forward let's see if she'll come back yes hang on so i need to Liam, maybe you can help spotlight. <laughs> I can't find my own spotlight. <laughs> <laughs> can't find your spotlight but... there you go. Hi, Kim. Welcome back. We're kind of coming to a close. I think it was an amazing easy day as 
as it could be virtually. But I also wanted to uh, uh, just kind of thank you very much because it's really, really difficult to put all of this together with all these different people, all these different sort of presentations and all the communication that happens. So, so I wanted to thank you for this. And then uh, you also have a personal journey here at ASU. If I remember correctly, you're part of the community outreach team. That's the same group I am, mm -hmm. but you started like months before COVID hit. And so we're talking about all these big, huge events and having people run around our building and see all the really cool things that are here. And uh, you, you sort of had to learn virtually. So, so what's yeah. the experience like? Are you excited about having a live public in here? I am excited. I'm excited to actually meet our community in person and um, you know, just start showing off what we do in person in ISTB4 and the other buildings on the campus. And so, yes, you were correct. I started about six weeks before we shut down for COVID. So I got to see what Open Door was like, um, but it was already, everything was already planned out. So I just sort of showed up and sort of experienced it. But um, yeah, so I'm, I'm excited to see what, what we're gonna do in 2022 and, and meet everybody that's been coming here virtually. So hopefully we can come back to campus and, and experience what we, um, what we do. So, I think that's great. So but I couldn't have, I couldn't have done all this without all the amazing people on our on our panel today. So it's it's a very much a team effort. So I appreciate yeah, everybody. Definitely a together. chance to thank uh, Alicia and Alex uh, for helping here. Justin uh, was uh, was a major help online, and I also wanted to do a special shout out to Meg Hufford. She's she's here with us today. You didn't see her face on the screen, but uh, she essentially managed this particular event for many 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 years uh, when we were live, and uh, is an integral part of our programming even today as we sort of get out into schools both virtually and when we welcome those schools back. So so thank you, Meg for that. Um, I wanted to also just, uh, Kim, help me announce, I think we've uh, two virtual night skies remaining before the end of the year. One of them we is do. going to be on November the 17th and the other one on December 1st. On the 17th, we're just going to take a really good look at our winter night sky. It's going to be about stargazing. It's going to be about what you get to see from your backyard in the sky and some of the stories that are playing out there. On December 1st, we're gonna do a look forward to 2022. Uh, we're excited about getting back, but we're also excited about the, the launch of several missions and some things. So you're gonna have to visit us again on those two dates, Wednesday night, the 17th, Wednesday night, uh, December 1st. And you're gonna learn a lot about sort of what we're doing in space and, uh, and what we're looking forward to. I'm gonna announce again, open door. That's gonna be the target. That's gonna be when we get back on campus and we open up in a big, huge public way and that is uh, February 26th is that right Kim? Um, yes February 26th and I think it's going to be an afternoon event so be looking for that in your emails we'll invite you to come and join us. Okay then one more thing I just wanted to share as a comment about the program today is I think Kim correct me if I'm wrong but we had leadership the director of the program we've had faculty on the program today we've had researchers on the program today both grad students and undergrad students on the program today and staff members that are sort of like representing our building and there's one thing i saw that i think they all have in common if i'm right i think they all love what they do they yes. all are here self-selected to be here they all have a passion about their own research their own education their own roles at the university and uh, and uh, at the school of earth and space exploration and uh, the passion it translates into their our ability to talk to others our ability to deliver outreach and we want to be a part of the community as much as we want to be an academic institution and a research institution we want to be uh, the bigger role of being an outreach uh, to the community itself. And so, so do yes, I have absolutely. that right, Kim? Did you we do. have all of those people here? So. Yes, we had, we had, CC was represented 100% um, across the board. So it's, it's a great place to be and I encourage everybody to come back and visit. Yeah. So. And as I wander around week to week, I can't meet one of them that isn't uh, worthy of sort of talking on, on the air and talking about their program and talking about what their, uh, their aspirations are. So, well, uh, if there's anything, if there's nothing else, let's uh, bring this to a close. I want to thank you We have thank one more thing. Much. Okay, we sorry. More thing. Um, we're going to share um, James Webb Space Telescope. We're going to oh, share one right. short video because that's going to be our next big virtual event here. Yeah. Launch in December. 
Good. As the video is setting up, let me just remind everybody. So what we think is that the James Webb Space Telescope is going to launch from Kourou, which is in French Guiana in South America, on December the 18th. And we believe it's going to launch kind of early in the morning, uh, something like 5.20 our time. Now I say all this and I'm pretty specific about it, but if you know missions and you know launches, uh, weather can happen and delays can happen. Uh, missions operate in a window. They have a, a target, but they uh, they can actually sort of uh, delay and do all that kind of things. But we're, we're, we're hoping this one sticks uh, December the 18th, a long time coming. We will be broadcasting live. We'll share a NASA feed from that launch and we'll have uh, people here on site that can uh, also help interpret what's going on and ASU's role in um, what we is sort of getting ready for the launch and then the kind of research we're going to do once that space telescope gets deployed and out in space and um, we'll, we'll, we'll follow it as it goes. You guys can join us for sure. So go ahead and make sure that video for us. Well, audience, thank you very much for uh, joining us on this Saturday. It's a beautiful day. Get out there and enjoy the weather. It's going to get cold soon. Uh, please keep uh, aware of us. Keep uh, uh, looking for us on our online resources. Um, we have several virtual offerings coming up. We look forward to being live and virtual as we go through next year. And so, uh, so thanks for uh, joining us for EC Day. And I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone.